So we sit down with the owner of Connected Cannabis Co., Caleb Counts. Tells us about his beginnings in cannabis, how he got started, all the way to where he's at today. We highlight some key points about who bred the biscotti, the Migos, and how they started rapping about the strain, and the Travis Scott deal, plus much, much more. An untold story that's never before been heard. Let the man tell it himself. Let's get right into it. Make sure you like, subscribe, and comment below. You already know it's first smoke of the day where you get the smoke first. Let's let Caleb get into it. Yo, what's up, man? We're back. First smoke of the day. It's episode 37, and this is the season three finale. Big episode right here. I'm your host, Pat Gods, here with my co-host, Blackleaf. What up, what up? Man, and we got a super special guest in the building. He came down today, he pulled up in something, and go ahead and introduce yourself, big dog. I'm not even going <laughs> to... Appreciate it. Uh, Caleb Counts, one of the founders of Connected Cannabis. Uh, pretty stoked to be here today. Thanks for having me. Man, appreciate you coming on, sharing your time. And you got a hell of a story that I can't wait to get into. Yeah, uh, you don't think of it like that when you're living it and when you've lived it, you just like keep moving. But when you sit back and think about it, when everyone's like, bro, you got a fucking crazy story. It's time to tell it. I'm like, fair enough. And no now is finally the time. I think enough, it's the first time I've told it. Enough people Ooh. have. So this is the first time you ever dropped the connected story yeah in any sort of public forum like other than having a couple of drinks with some boys like this is the first time it'll have come out of my mouth that's for sure well and you're like super not in the limelight for like the weed nerds you're like <laughs> who's behind connected yeah. <laughs> i know it, that wasn't really mystery. done purposefully it was just it's kind of like i don't know that's like not really my thing i didn't know how to do it to be honest but it's also just like a factor of just like keeping your head down and just like keep going and there's a lot of drama in the weed space and i just i've always just liked to stay f clear of drama and keep cool keep a solid reputation i think we've done a really good job of it and um and i think because of that that allows us or me the opportunity to finally to come on and like tell our story because we've run a clean show you know I think so. You and, focused on the weed. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm proud of everything we've done, every move we've made and I've got no secrets, uh, nothing, nothing to hide. So, and, and you know, it's a sign of the times and we can talk about this shit, right? It's been that long. We've worked that hard where we couldn't really say shit. I mean, you could, but it's a matter of choice, a matter of privacy, a matter of fuck safety, whatever, but it's a different time. So I'm excited where we're at and I'm excited to tell it absolutely man blessed to be here bro i'm blessed to be able to hear this man this is this is going out with a bang right here tell, <laughs> tell us about tell us about growing up man the young count and i it's cool because I, I follow you on instagram i see your sons and stuff uh -huh. and i i see the i see it coming you know what i mean yeah. so it's cool to see but tell us about you know you coming up and how that was so I was, I was born in Whittier, not too far from here if, for those that don't know it's like east los angeles county um and my parents were both blue collar, but, but my mom's side of the family, my, my grandpa was a doctor. And so like they had some money, but my dad's side of the family were teachers. So I grew up in a unique environment. Like sometimes on the weekends, I'd go to the country club some, and then the other times I'm down, but I didn't fit in at the country club because it wasn't me. It wasn't my money. You know, I was on there on my grandparents membership. Right. And so I didn't fit in there. And then the other times I'm down, uh, downtown, uh, Whittier skating around. I was big into skating back then. It was just like a unique environment growing up, like with those two contrasting situations. We didn't live in a super nice neighborhood. Um, but so I always had that contrast. So I always got to see the nice things in life, but we, I couldn't touch it directly. Like my family didn't have them, my immediate family. So I was always around it. And from a very early age, I decided like, I'm going to fucking 
I'm going to be able to touch all that shit. All that shit's going to be mine. I'm going to have all those options and I'm going to do it my way. I'm not going to do it in this bump, uh, buttoned up country club style. You know, I'm going to do it my fucking way. And, and, and my mom, my parents saw that and that was concerning for them from, from early, early age. They didn't know how to handle it. They, they didn't like money, nice things, cars, money were very important to me. And, and I think it was because I saw it, I got made fun of for not having it. And I was like, I'm going to figure out a way to get it, you know? So, so yeah, grew up in LA or uh, Whittier until, until I was like 12, started to get in a lot of trouble. LA was getting worse. Um, I got caught selling weed, uh, in seventh grade, um, early eighties. Yeah, that would have been seventh grade. I think you're probably 10. So that would have been maybe 90. Yeah. I think, or no, I was like 11, maybe 12. So it was like 91, 92. Um, the one guy at school that had the plug happened to be my friend Caesar. He had an older <laughs> cousin that was in a gang. And Shout he, out to Caesar. <laughs> yeah, Caesar, dude. You I really started appreciate this. you, man. You really put me on. Oh, man. you started this, bro. No, but you no, did, man. Yeah. Caesar. I don't even think you... he liked to smoke. And but he had the plug and he just wanted and he brought it. And and I started getting a couple of dimes off of him, taking my haircut money, buying some dimes. And then people started hitting me up, and I'm like, well, fuck, you know, I sold one and I'm like, well, it was hard enough for me to get it. What am I doing? So then I fucking shaved it down a little bit, put a little, I just wanted smoke and that's where it clicked. It's just like when you got the plug that you have a responsibility and you have all opportunities. And so it started with Caesar. I got caught selling my very second bag in the, in the boys hell. bathroom at Dexter got suspended. Um, and uh, my parents just started seeing it and then I just started smoking regularly. And of course I was just LA brick weed, you know, about 50% seed and stem, about 50% flower. And uh, my parents were like, we got to get out of here. They weren't like in LA and we moved to central California. So I moved from Dexter, which had like 800 kids at a middle school to Templeton, which is Central California, right by Paso Robles in San Luis Obispo County. My parents plopped me down there. We bought eight acres in the country and fucking I went to school and I was like, what? There was fucking people wearing cowboy hats. I honestly did not know that people did that in California, belt buckles, cowboy hats. I, th I thought that was costume shit. And there was cows on campus and shit. Wow. Okay. But I brought some weed with me and I brought my skateboard and figured out where the fucking skaters kicked it and started making friends, friends that way. So that was, that was my, uh, those were my early years. Went to high school there. went to Chico state, um, for college same thing brought weed up there and I, I started i sold weed all through high school only got caught by my parents ever um but why i didn't stop because i would always find my stash that they were keeping <laughs> with a fucking pipe and shit i'm like what the fuck is going on here my parents are fucking busting me up they were super strict then taking my weed and keeping it and smoking it so i'm like fuck this i can relate to that this is a fucking it's game up. <laughs> it's, it's, this is a game. it's a fucking game and i'm gonna win <laughs> <laughs> oh god uh, experience they say is the uh root of creativity uh -huh. and you have a lot already just with the story you're telling yeah. i mean look at how far you've already experienced you you got the country club you got the la and now you're in the country with you know straight boots and hats and yeah and they're also friendly to weed so where does that go? Like there, I mean, everyone smokes. So yeah, well that at that time, smoking was not cool. And that, that it was super conservative. So there was, you know, there was the partiers and then there was the, the non partiers and the partiers were a much smaller group, but I, I played football. So, you know, and I was always big. And so I, I fit in with both groups kind of, you know, I mean, definitely with the skaters and, and the stoners and shit, but I also rubbed elbows with everyone else, which all the skaters didn't usually play sports. And so I was kind of in that, it was, it was just a similar situation to LA, right? I'm at the country club. I don't really belong there, but I'm like shoulder to shoulder with them. But then I'm going to school with, you know, you know, Dexter was in, in a super urban area and drew people from all over different bunch of different ethnicities and a bunch of different, uh, uh, income levels and everything. So it was unique. So this was just another chapter in like, where the fuck does Caleb fit in? And I fit in where I'm fucking, who's ever buying the weed. 
no crippy yet. No, I no high end, uh, like, like a uh, high end fire. Not yet. when I moved to Templeton, I started sophomore year. I started, it started to come around a little bit. Santos Zertucci is the first one I bought a fucking eighth off of $60 eighth. It was probably 2.8 grams, <laughs> and, but it was fire. Some fucking little tiny little fucking hardball green nugs that he was getting from Santa Barbara. And then there was a kid in high school. I don't even remember what his full name is, but he went by the Berg and his weed was called the Berg and his parents grew and he got to sell it for him. So he had the lifted truck. I mean, this guy was like a fucking movie star legend in that area. <laughs> and I started getting that shit. That was 1400 a QP. If you could even get a QP, 1600, 1600 a QP. And so it started to trickle in. So I was still buying brick to flip from the, from the gangsters. Um, and then, uh, and I'll never forget my first opportunity to like rise up because I was always had to go through a middleman. I didn't know anyone. I was always new and I was getting it from this guy, but I could sit in the room, but I wasn't dealing with them. And my buddy had to be there. And one day he needed some money. Uh, I think his name was Memo. Um, never even knew his Greg was his real name and he needed some money and he got my number and called me directly. He's like, I'll sell you a half pound right now of, of brick weed. And, uh, and I was just buying QPs. I was like, I don't have the money for the whole thing. He's like, I'll front half of it to you pay half. I need the money. And that's when I really realized how fronting could work. And then the pressure's on right now. You owe someone money that you're kind of scared of and you fucking hustle it. And you think, you know, fuck, how am I going to sell all this? But when the pressure's on. That's, that's when I started to understand that feeling, that, that adrenaline rush of like, I owe some fucking dude money. <laughs> I've got the stack. I got to fucking make this. I got to, I got to do it. And I flipped it super fast, got him his money way quicker. And then that rush and then hit seeing his like stoke on that, like his appreciation. And then he started giving me more and it just, and then that, it just kept meeting people. And then I understood, well, how about you give me an extra? Cause cash, I didn't have cash. My, I used to work at fucking Taco Bell. That was my first fucking job in high school. Really? So yeah, I was working at Taco Bell, selling sacks on the Cooking side. Cooking in the back or what? Yeah. I would do everything. My favorite thing was to wrap the burritos, but they never let me do that. Um, so I'd cashier some in the back, but you enjoyed wrapping the burritos. Yeah. yeah, I loved it. It's just, just I, I don't know. I like when I can do stuff with my hand and you can, hands and you can like create something. Mm -hmm. I used to be super like try to get it all perfect. And I was proud of my fuck talk about burritos. Back then. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> Funny thing awesome. is my, my partner, Luke, uh, my like core partner, his first job was Taco Bell too. And we were just sitting with someone the other day. I forget who it was. And their first job was fucking McDonald's and they made it. And it's just like, it's kind of cool. It's kind of, it's funny. It's kind of corny, but it's also fucking cool. Like I, you know, I got no fucking shame, dude. That's where I fucking started. It's awesome. I think it's cool to think like, if you drove through central California in the nineties, you might've eaten a burrito wrapped by the owner of connected or one of the founders. Like that's like cool as shit. <laughs> like, bro, yeah, that's pretty funny. Right? When you put it like trippy, that. man. Yeah. And so I did the same thing when I went to college, I brought a half pound with me in the dorms. I had that little fucking sentry briefcase safe, that thing that you could pop with a fucking Swiss army knife <laughs> came with the little fucking great. scale. I had not the Tanita, but it was a, something it started with an A. I forget what it was called. It was like more expensive than the Tanita. It was like uh, what scale you had back then was a little bit of a flex. I don't know if you guys remember, I it, but when the Tanita is what everyone could get, but when you could find like a different, more expensive one and you busted that out people are like damn where'd you get that scale <laughs> wow <laughs> it's funny that's like we were talking about earlier like things you're gonna remember i just remembered that flex i yeah. went out of town i found that fucking scale and i bought one that no one else had and people tripped on that that like elevated your fucking status in the <laughs> that made people want to come back to you yeah, yeah it elevated your status i had a pager and i fucking made business cards at first people laughed but then the pager started ringing just on normal paper. I just printed it at my parents' house. There was a, there was a, in, I don't even know if it was Microsoft word back then, whatever it was, but I know you're talking I, about. it had a, it had that format <laughs> oh. and I just put Caleb and my number and it's all it said. And they were the flimsy fucking normal fucking paper. 
and I handed them out. And like I said, a few people clowned me, but then that number started fucking ringing. And I was one of the, one of the guys who moved like the easiest guy, the quickest guy. I was pretty active because I was always doing sports. So I could do, drop it before or after school. So, and I brought it to Chico and, uh, met a guy then i met another guy but <laughs> he got busted and so we I, I didn't have a connect for a while i let everything play at chill out for a while and then i quietly like sent a little message um you know hey like can i get anything he's like let me see what we can do and so he called his guy and he was just gonna middle it he's like you need cash this time i'm like cool buy a couple pounds we drove out to this golf course on the edge of town in Chico and I had a little two door, uh, single cab T1 Toyota T100 and Ryan was in shotgun and we pull up and there's this Mexican dude with a cowboy hat, fucking ostrich skin boots, three gold chains. He's like 45, 50 years old, front gold tooth. And I am like, what in the fuck? You're like, we're just here for weed. I promise. <laughs> I swear to God. I'm like, what? Holy he brings man. you some square packages. Dude, like, oh, with shit. a scorpion yeah, on it. Why with some that duct it? tape Wrong around. Dude. Wrong dude. <laughs> dude. And he comes up to the window and he's like, fuck. I fucking lock my keys in my car. You gotta take me to my fucking house. The weed's in the car. I'm fucking. I, I'm locked out. This guy with the gold tooth. This fucking the, guy. Oh, and I'm like, oh, oh my god. First time even meeting him. And there's oh. no room. What are the three of us gonna sit? So we leave Ryan there, and I drive the dude back to his fucking house. And we go back to Chico, which is like 15 minutes. We go back, barely talk on the way there. He's like shooting the shit, a super awkward small talk. And, and now you know where he lives. So that's yeah, even awkward. Right. Yep. And so he gets out. He fucking, we're in its middle of the day, crawls through his window. He looks like he's <laughs> robbing the place. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Comes out, gets his keys. We hop back in. He goes, hey, so how much can you really move? And I'm like, you know. All I have cash for is is two to three at a time. Right now, this is outdoor. Outdoor is like twenty eight hundred a pound back then. Shitty fucking outdoor. Like the outdoor that the 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 Mexicans would go out into the hills and live like a, you know whatever fifty miles off of a road and not come back until the shit's harvest. Like that kind of outdoor. <laughs> <laughs> and holy shit and so 2800 he's like okay cool he's like can you take a look can you move more and same combo like it's just and he's like well i want to start working directly with you and i'm like well you know we can't i can't cut out ryan like i'm not like that he's like we'll pay him what do you think it'll take and he's like i was like i don't fucking know i've never done this he's like you talk to him tell him i'll give him a pound fuck him but i don't want to deal with him anymore he's bullshit i want to yeah you you were buying most of the weed anyways as i understand it i want to work with you and smart he, guy yeah and he i was like so fucking nervous ryan was going to be mad because i got taught early you'd never disrespect you never jump you don't di you know jump the plug you don't fucking do any of that shit i learned really quick yeah, you like, get cut out yeah you just you just respect people see all that. that they stop trusting you yeah yeah well, it's and, a proper rule for a reason for sure yeah and it's just like you got your reputation and that's all you have that's at it. the end of the day you don't have a resume in the fucking weed game you got your reputation on what people are going to say about you and i learned mm -hmm. that super early and because I saw some people do some dumb shit and what happened to them, their businesses or whatever. And I was like, that's never going to be me. And so I told Ryan, Ryan had just been busted. He's got lawyer fees. He's like, fuck yeah, I'll take a fucking pound to get out of the way. He's probably making a couple hundred bucks on each pound. So to get a $2,800 thing after you just got popped, like, oh, so, so then I just kept working anyways. with the guy. And he had his separate little trap house on down a little dirt road. And I would go there, man, and this motherfucker would just test me with everything. He had two illegals living there that he had brought over, did not speak one word of English, a big ass pit bull. And it was probably like the whole house was probably like 800 square feet. And the pit bull was always on the other side of the door. He would put me in a chair kind of right here. The pit bull, he would let me see it sometimes, but I could never touch it. Cause I love dogs. I'm yeah. not afraid of pit bulls. I could never touch it. And when he would, sh it was friendly when it was around, but when the door was shut, it was right there. Just like, ah, ah. so I'm sitting in the chair, the fucking paper thin door pit bull. These two guys just looking at me fucking, I mean, cowboy boots. I mean, I'm not talking fucking gangsters. I'm talking like uh, originals, like the OGs, like the fucking shit in the movies. They're talking to the boys down, down south of the border. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, And he would fucking, 
he, one of them was a cook. He would always cook no matter what time of day. And he would make me eat a plate of food. If I was full, he said, I don't care. You're going to eat that. He would make me do a few other things. What food? Do you remember what he was cooking? Bomb. It was so really? bomb. It was usually, he always had tilapia. So he's always making fish tacos, fish and like a tomato sauce. It wasn't like your typical like carne asada tacos or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It was always like, because this guy was a chef in Mexico. So it was always something that I hadn't really had before. And, and I grew up in LA on mexican food like i love it this is a proper plug you get fed you get weed but it was weird it was like this forced (laughs) fed like if you it didn't matter if you weren't hungry it was just like do this he would put some other things in front of me and be like do this and fuck it It was oh and it two years into the relationship he was always still testing me like it it, he got way slack but every once in a while he'd fucking test me and be like do this or let me see your phone and just like fucking look through my phone real quick. Like we'd be super cool do, doing. And at this point we we're doing sometimes 50, sometimes hundred pound deals and fucking you just still test me sometimes. He must've had a tumultuous past and that's what put him there. I yeah. can only imagine. Yeah. He was a, he was a character. He was for sure a character. Sometimes he'd have, he had these guys from Colorado come that would drive all the way from Colorado in a big ass Cadillac. Uh, I forget which model, but like the biggest one with the biggest trunk. And sometimes I'd be there for that. And these were like serious motherfuckers and they would fill that truck up. I mean, I'm fucking like 20, 20 years old at this point, 21, like it's not that young, but I'm like going to college. And it was like some weird, it was some crazy shit. These are grown men. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. And dude, I was just like living. I was in college. Everyone else is like eating top ramen, drinking the well drinks. I'm like gray goose fucking <laughs> buying the whole bar shots, trips to Cabo, staying in the Pedregal. Like, dude, it was crazy. I was living the life. But to get there, you had to deal with that other side of things that yeah. most people would never deal with because yeah. that is serious shit. Yeah. It, and it just it happened and you just kind of accept it like. I've, it's like in the movies or you hear some of these stories, like a lot of these situations, a lot of the people that, you know, I'm not trying to compare myself to someone in a movie, but like you get, you're like selling whatever you're making money. And all of a sudden you're in a situation, like, are you ready to step up or not? And you didn't plan the situation. You didn't ask for the situation, but it's that you make a decision. Like, am I going to go to the next level? And like, I'm fucking 20 years old doing fucking 50, hundred pound outdoor deals all on the front, basically with some guy that looks like he's killed multiple or at least <laughs> ordered the death of a few people <laughs> and, and certainly acted like it. And it's just like, just did it and just kept going. It was crazy, man. And that's all through college years. That was which just Ch- at Chico, that which was just geographically at- in California, like Chico's like the hub. Yeah. I didn't know that at that time. Like I didn't know anything about growing back then. You know, my experience was in LA and almost no one grew in the central coast because they were cowboys. Like they didn't look upon that shit good at all. Like you get wrapped up for the little, littlest shit there. There's a lot of tweakers around the central coast. And so the cops were just on high alert, kind of treating everyone like tweakers. If you looked like a little alternative, different, the skaters got pressed hard by the cops all the time. So you just, a lot of people didn't fuck around like that one guy grew weed and no one could ever really go direct to him like he was kind of like a a legend like you would see him from time to time in his truck but i didn't even know what he looked like that's how crazy it was and then chico i didn't understand that growing world i had never heard of of these dudes living camping 50 miles out in the wilderness fucking eating canned food like he was like oh yeah we drop their food once a week at a drop spot and they're hiking like 40 miles to get that shit and then hiking back in i mean no fucking way to contact anyone i mean can you just imagine no. that being brought up from mexico and sent into the mountains to grow fucking weed and fucking for just, about what three months at a time yeah about three yeah. full months yeah at least of living i mean Four, at least exactly yeah, yeah probably about four months by the time you're all done and chico's hot as fuck so they're out there 105 degree summers fucking you know moving uh, pulling water from fucking way over there and growing underneath trees and and uh, god forbid they run up on you and you got to either shoot it they shoot it out or they run right 
Yeah, I mean, whoo. Yeah, it was, it was, it was crazy. So I learned a lot during that. But then outdoor, people started to get sick of outdoor. And then the BC bud was coming through. And we would see it. And at first, everyone thought it was good because you didn't see indoor in any kind of bulk. Like if you could get two, three pounds of indoor at a time, you were fucking Johnny on the spot. Like, and these dudes all of a sudden were coming through with 100, 200, 300 packs of fucking BCs. And when they started, they weren't terrible. They got really watered down and bad. The triple A's. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I got on with the crew um, that was doing that. And I switched, I stopped selling outdoor completely and I was just moving that. And that's when the paper started really coming in. And I mean, I have to, I think I was probably making like 15, 20 grand a month as a college student. I mean that in the nineties, like the, in, or I guess that would be early two thousands. It was fucking a lot of money. Killing yeah, it. Yeah. Absolutely. I was killing it. And you were doing something you enjoyed. Yeah, I, I did. And and I always, I was always like generous. I was always like sharing and throwing parties, especially because all my friends are like, like I got two dollars for a burrito for lunch. Like you know, it's college. <laughs> just no one had a bunch of money, so I was just always sharing it. Always just having fat parties and and when when we would travel, if someone couldn't afford a plane ticket, it's like, but you got to be there. You're in, you know, you got to take the drugs, but you're coming. <laughs> <laughs> never forget we went to cabo my buddy brian all uh i was like hey i'll pay for your ticket we gotta take the weed and we gave him an ounce of the nastiest fucking stinkiest perp and he fucking didn't we didn't have vacuum sealers this motherfucker put it in one ziploc bag and put it under his nuts on the plane the entire plane smelled like weed how he didn't get in trouble fucking is beyond me uh, that was a good that was those a good. are the metal detector days <laughs> oh yeah yeah yeah. There was way no, butter man Holy yeah shit. i think people though that don't live in cali think like oh we was always cool in cali that just shows a lot of people, though, weed yeah. was still not even cool in the Mecca super, of weed. Super illegal. Because, you know, it's known as the Mecca of weed, right, you know, no matter right. where you go, in the and honestly, in the world. <laughs> yeah. And to think that, like, back in those days, the, the 90s and the early 2000s, it still was a problem if you got caught with some weed. Oh, yeah. It was a big, I mean, that guy that got busted, he ended up getting 100, and, I think Ryan got sentenced to like 180 days in jail for, I think they busted him with five and a quarter pounds and barely any money. And I mean, that's like a, I think that's a ticket now. Like if you get caught with a five pack, I think you get a ticket and like, maybe you go to court or something. I'm not even sure what happens. You now. might get to sell it off. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just and kidding. fucking, but back then he, I th- he did some time. It's fucking oh, it was just man. different. And a lot of people think Northern because Northern California is where a lot of the weed culture originated. And it's humble. Humble was an Island and whatever happened out there was an Island, but the rest of Northern California was all cowboy law enforcement super fucking strict throw the book at you type shit um i don't know how it was in la but i know while i was operating in northern california you know years later as a as a medical operator that la guys is like what like we got three thousand lights that place gets but he's gonna take the fucking the felony for it my boy's gonna t- it's like and it's not even gonna do any time it's like it wasn't really no one was wow. really getting fucked up for anything in southern california that i really knew about but people in fucking northern california were getting the book thrown at them man how weird is that right and you're in the same state yeah it just shows you how crazy the past is of cannabis yeah. It's never been this one thing, even in the same state. Why you drive down south, you're going to jail for the same pound as up north, or you know, vice versa. Yeah, it's somewhat similar in Florida, North mm-hmm. Florida compared to South Florida. Really? You can get away with a lot more in South Florida, or they don't care as much. They uh-huh. don't really throw the book at you as much. Yeah. But North Florida, it's like you know, good old boy system. Right. You know, they'll throw the book at you. Right. But like weed. I'll, yeah. Holy yeah. hell. Yeah. You're like, what? <laughs> it's cowboy <laughs> shit. You know what I mean? Same thing. Obviously, Cali being bigger, but what what was it like, man, being in college and just how did it end with your with your uh your your connect that you were talking about that would, you know, have the dog and everything? <laughs> so uh, so yeah. I kind of petered off with him. I stopped working with him because the the BCs were coming in. Then 9-11 happened and I would have never, I don't think anyone thought that that could affect anything, but fucking the border basically shut and the fucking BCs. I think I maybe got 
a total of 30 or 40 pounds after 9-11 and then done. And so I had built this business based off of that. And it was already getting kind of hard because they were watered down a little bit at that point. And I couldn't really go back to outdoors. So I went from, and this has happened to me a few times in my life for various reasons, but I went from being at the top to the bottom and I fucking didn't have fucking, I didn't have a plug anymore. I relied solely on this one connect. It came through light clockwork for probably a year and a half. And I had burnt the outdoor situation. I didn't have clientele because people were on indoor now. And at least it looked good. It probably didn't smoke better, but, um, and and so I fucking wasn't selling weed all of a sudden and fuck my income dried up. And I had spent, I was spending all my money like a fucking fool. Cause I was the fronting amounts got so big. I never felt an incentive to build up a couple hundred racks to buy everything myself. I'm like, that's going to take forever to do. I'm living, you know, they're going to keep bringing it to me. I'm still good. I got credit. Well, the credit doesn't do you any good when there's no more fucking product left. And and it was interesting. It was a super humbling time. And I believe everyone needs to be humbled at certain times of their life, whether it's through failure um, from, from not seeing something or their ego getting too big or circumstances that were out of their control. And with me, it was like a little of both, right? I was naive to the fact that it would never end. I wasn't saving. And um, I got humbled. I was at the fucking top spending all the money and fucking couldn't even go out and and spend money on drinks anymore. I was making dinners at home. And it, it just felt like it was like that, but it was humbling. But then you also found out who your real friends were, right? Because everyone who's around when the party's there, um, fucking when the lights go out, who's standing next to you still? And some of the fucking, the people that are still standing next to me are fucking still my friends today, you know? Epic. And the other yeah. ones have just kind of, you know. Dwindled off. Yeah, dwindled off. And, and I really appreciated the lesson that that taught me. And it felt good to experience both sides and, and it's really helped all my business, you know, because I'm always aware that everything can go away. And, and that further cemented to me how important relationships were and how important my reputation was because through all that, I maintained all of that. I never fucked anyone on any money. I paid all the money I ever owed, even when things got tough. And looked around, saw who was left, and we had a good fucking time. Who paid their bills? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, and so for like the last year or so, and then I got in some trouble. I got in a fight. It was so fucking stupid, totally unnecessary. There's like a big fight uh, in front of one of the bars, and I hit this dude with a bottle in the face, a full Mickey's forty, and it broke and. Just one of the bouncers saw it, ratted me out, and I got a felony. And like all the shit I had done, I was committing felonies on a regular basis as part of my my income stream. And I wasn't even a fighter. I'm not like that. I, I don't like fighting. And I was fucking drunk, and it was a bunch of people, and it was just like a hyped up moment, made a split second decision. It's affected me for the fucking rest of my life. It still affects me today. Not super negatively, but I do have to explain it. It's a felony. I've got it expunged and I went through the whole thing, but every cannabis license I've had to get, it comes up. I have to write an explanation. Man. I've had my real estate license, my bail license. My real estate license took a year and a half to get after I passed the exam because you got to go through this crazy process to to get approved if you have a felony. And um, the bail license took a similar amount of time. And it was another humbling thing. It's like you make mistakes, you pay for your mistakes. It is my dad always taught me, you know, I didn't learn a lot from my dad, but I did learn <laughs> there's fucking consequences to every action. And the quicker you own up to those consequences, the better you'll be and the sooner things will get better. And uh that's, man, so that's a great that's point. A big game right there. Yeah. yeah. That's the truth. And and not enough we, we don't have enough of that it. in our fucking in this game. And this no. there's so much ego and there's so much shit. It's like fucking own up to it. Like yep. we're not fucking perfect. You make a mistake, the sooner you fucking jump on that sword, the more respect people are gonna give you, and the more respect your people are gonna fucking have for you, because they're gonna be like, It's okay to fuck up, own it and move on. Let's work together, figure out a solution. Damn, um, great point, man. Yeah, so it's it's certainly been a uh taking those points and those those humbling events in my life have really helped shape me and and just that focus on on reputation and 
I think that's another reason I've kind of remained like behind the scenes. It's like, I don't really need to prove anything to anyone because I've let my actions do it. Um, I've, I mean, we've got relationships still, we being connected that we've had since we built our first grow. The electrician that fucking did our first grow wasn't even a licensed electrician. He had learned by himself messing around, reading books. But like back then you needed a safe fucking guy and he learned. Now the guy has a full on, it's Borelli's electric. Love that motherfucker. He's got a huge company, mostly does cannabis. He's done the, some of the biggest builds in Sacramento and Northern California. And he cut his teeth with us, but we cut our teeth with him. We learned together. I remember I paid his first for his first insurance certificate to help him get license. And when I fucking pick up the phone, it doesn't matter if it's faulty breaker in my basement, he answers and, and he'll, he'll help me. These guys will help me anytime, day or night. Same with AC Joe same with Anderson plumbing. These guys have, we've been, to, we built it together and we don't make money. Like he, of course he makes money off my job and whatever, but it's not a, and I've given those guys so many referrals. You can use, say you're with, cause back then you didn't want people to say like, Oh, you can tell them you did shit for connected, you mm -hmm. know, no, keep your fucking mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I let them do that stuff. And could we, so hold on. So going from, BC's drying up. Yeah, what happened and after the BC's yeah, drying up? Because oh, okay, yeah, Connected yeah. gets started, and we yeah. got to get to that. Okay, like, yeah, yeah, sorry. So the lead up. So I graduated. Oh, I'm like, fuck. I was like, not selling weed. I barely had any connects anymore. I'm like, I graduated. I'm like, time to, I guess, fucking be an adult. And I went and got a job uh, doing real estate. I was in sales, like new home sales in Sacramento. And I did that for like four or five years and it was fine. It was good money. It was in the real estate boom. And as the market started to dry up, a bunch of my buddies in, in the Bay area that had done mortgage had all bought these 4,000. They're all single guys, all about these 4,000 square foot, five bedroom, plus a bonus room houses, three car garages <laughs> and the fucking mortgage market and real estate market started to dry up. And everyone had eight, 10 lights of fucking perps. And none of them really had outlets. And I fucking started weaseling my way in. I'm like, let me fucking sell your shit. I'll make a hundred bucks a pound. I don't care. Like I just needed to build back in. I needed to get back to my people. I started selling to some of the people back in, in San Luis Obispo. Still um, to this point, no growing, no live plants. I mean, I had done, I paid for a two lighter and one of my buddies closets in Chico, but I didn't grow it. I just paid for the equipment. Massive failure. Um, but so no, no, I did grow my first weed plant in Whittier on the other side of my parents' fence. I took a seed out of the, out of the stress and the fucking plant grew nine feet tall before I killed it. I, I, it was, you know, it was Mexican fucking stress weed, but I grew a nine feet tall, nine foot tall plant. It did not flower. We ended up moving to central California before it flowered. And I basically killed it by dumping I didn't read the instructions on the fish emulsion. I was just rifling through my dad's shit. Fish emulsion dumped it straight <laughs> onto the fucking soil. No water, no nothing. The fucking thing died. Smart though, on the other side of the fence. Yeah, it was I like directly. That. Other, my uh, parents are always like, what are you doing on the other side of the fence? And they looked and like couldn't see it. This huge weed plant. And they grew weed fucking when I was a kid that I found out later. If you saw on my Instagram, there is one picture of me standing next to a fucking weed plant in a diaper holding a baby bottle. So <laughs> I didn't know this until my parents uh, started being honest with me when I was like 17 or 18, that they grew weed up and smoked weed like chimneys up until <laughs> uh, I was like three or four. And then they were like, we got to stop. We got to fuck. This isn't safe um to, to be around the kids like a lot of people yeah i, I think i've heard that story a lot it like was so that. fucking hypocritical though they were so strict they drug tested me in high school oh fucking wow. they were so strict grounded me took the car away everything and they 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 caught me selling weed a few times but they were like i remember they're like we're fucking gonna drug test you like you because if you want to drive if you want your driver's license you need to test clean and we know you're gonna fail <laughs> 
back then, I don't even think they had like the fucking test. I mean, I'm sure they had some bullshit test kits, but I came up with the idea. I'm like, I know fucking Daryl Roberts doesn't smoke weed. I play football <laughs> with him. I know I'm getting tested after football <laughs> practice. Shout out to Daryl. Daryl Roberts, dude. He's in the military now. He probably still doesn't smoke weed. <laughs> that fucking guy came through for me and I fucking took one of my dad's glass cigar tubes. Daryl fucking peed in it in football practice on a Saturday morning <laughs> and fucking I knew it would have to stay warm, right? And this is going to sound fucked up. No. I wedged it in my Oh, okay. Not because because I wanted it to stay warm, right? Not up my ass. Everyone's like, oh, up your ass. Yeah. No. Like, I just wedged it there because I knew because it was long and I had to keep it warm. Poured it into the cup. My parents were furious when I passed that drug test. They were like, there's no fucking way. I still got in trouble as wow. if I failed. They're like, there's no way. <laughs> wow yeah, oh bro funny. i love that you played this like a game every part of it like even with the seat on the other side of the fence even with everything it's like okay let's let's see where we get with this yeah yeah <laughs> it was i mean and really that's what life that's what i realized that life is and mm. that's what success that's how you achieve success is just playing the game better than they teach you like, as if you just play by the rules that you get taught in school, your parents tell you, you're going to be average. And the last thing I was going to do was be average like my parents. I was just like, I'm not going to live like they fought like crazy over money all the time. And I'm like, this isn't going to fucking happen. And I saw my grandparents and they never fought. And they, I mean, not money doesn't fucking buy happiness, but as a kid, you're seeing that shit. And I'm like, they got money. They're never fighting. My parents are fighting like fucking crazy. They're average. They're breaking their backs. I'm never going to fucking be like that. And so, and I even tell people today, I'm like, I don't even think college is, is in, college is not about what you learn in those books. What I learned in college is how to game the system, how to fucking do just enough. It's all about time management, right? How to do just enough to get by, but like the absolute bare minimum. So you're maximizing your time because those books don't teach you shit. I knew more about business selling fucking weed by the time I was going to college than I learned at all period in college end of discussion. It wasn't even close. And, but you learn how to manage your time and fucking game the system. It's worth going though, because those connections 100%. in that time, I, I, th I think priceless. everyone should go to college, yes. but not because what you're going to learn in the classroom, uh, what you're going to learn as a fucking, the as experience. a man or a woman figuring out that the whole life is a game everything is a game when it comes to business or getting ahead. And it's like, if you're not playing it, you're getting fucking played a hundred percent, a hundred percent fact. Ooh. So you got to be the fucking rule maker. You got to fucking make the rules. Like don't let someone make them for you. You're going to be average. Love it, bro. Straight up. And, and with that, where does connected start? So, okay. I started getting my buddy's weed. <laughs> I can get off track sometimes. No, I, that's <laughs> the perfect entrance to this. I love it, bro. You just set this, the mode, the yeah. mood, the whole scene. I started uh, selling my buddy's packs um, that they were growing in their garages and shit. And, um, and I only had a couple of people to sell it to and I was fronting it to them. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to fucking try a dispensary. And Sacramento had had four dispensaries for a while. They had kind of been left alone. So I went into one on X street and, um, and I waited in the lobby for fucking 30 minutes before anyone could see me and check my rec. They were <laughs> rude. The security guard was fucking rude, fucking scary, fucking sawed off shotgun, <laughs> fucking and there was, I was just watching people blow through, blow through. And then you walk upstairs. It was like in a little house. You walk upstairs and there's like a little buy room. There's a couple hippie chicks fucking smoking weed, blowing it in my face. Here's the weed, Ziploc bags. I'm like, this is the worst fucking weed. This is the worst fucking customer service. And in the 30, 40 minutes I've been here, I've watched fucking 50 to 100. I don't even know how many people. It was crazy. I'm like, I could do this way better. Figured out how to... uh figured out how to open up and it was just like tricky paperwork because they didn't have permits back then and i was open up six months later quit my job in real estate opened up my first staff meeting that i can remember i told the three people i was like i don't give a fuck about being the biggest all i care about is being the best we're going to provide the best service we're going to get the best weed possible you fucking treat the vendors with respect because it was a big deal. I got treated so disrespectfully as a vendor. And back then, 
shops got off, buyers got off on treating vendors like shit. How the fuck yeah. are you going to treat these guys like shit? Like you need them. If you want the best yeah. price, treat them better. Get them, keep them coming back. Make them feel welcome. Like vendor comes in our front door at Fruit Ridge straight to the back. No three hour fucking mind game sitting in the lobby with a duffel bag. Why fucking every Tom, Dick and Harry comes by and looks at you fucking wondering what car you're in. Cause we, when I opened up too, everyone was kind of downtown in these like trendy or cool areas. And I was like, I'm not going to compete with them. I know where the fucking money's at. It's in the fucking hood. I went <laughs> straight to the fucking hood where there was only one other shop and I found a fucking shop. I'm like, I ain't scared to, scared to be here. We fucking opened up and cause that's also easier spot to find landlords and, and treated your customers. Right. And it's so dope that you like that's number one, because we all know what it's like to feel the other way when the girls are either just rude as hell. And like, it's like, you're a privilege like you should be happy to be here or the other mode of like as a vendor where you show up with all your bag and stuff and then they're like yo they can't see you today you're like oh, i just drove like two hours with a bunch of weed right you know that type of stuff and they told you to come oh no yeah this is a set appointment yeah 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 and it would all that shit was backwards like all that stuff works every all that kind of bullshit works temporarily until competition comes until fucking karma hits you and you get fucking pistol whipped for some fucking bad attitude or something you treat the one get wrong guy fucking wrong one time and you fuck it's stupid so it's all short-term mentality yeah and i wasn't gonna have it and so this is a team that i started with we're all close friends and uh and just fucking everyone we just had a good time dude it was like the cheers of dispensaries people would fucking come in there and chew our ears off for an hour and we'd let them never rush anyone never kick anyone out we definitely weren't the most cracking spot, but we did pretty fucking good. We made enough money. What was it called? Fruit Ridge Health and Wellness. Fruit Ridge, Ridge Health, Health and Wellness. Boy, real history. The beginning. Not many people know. And 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 shout out to Doja, Big Doja, man. <laughs> yep. Um, I see where he he put it on there. He and we'll get back to it. I know I'm digressing, but he said that you created designer weed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> that's so funny to think of it like that. I guess it's true, but. He said you guys are pushing right that, here? that hashtag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah yes, sir. Anywhere you want, bro. Um, yeah, so we um so we got it. I was realized very quickly to be competitive, you have to have more control over your supply. It doesn't matter how good we treat people, like fucking we we just like not on some schedule. It's not like the delivery trucks here every Thursday. And sometimes we didn't have good access. I'm like, we gotta learn how to grow. Part of it was for the money. I was also obsessed with the forums. I was looking at uh, the forums, the grow forums back then, I was just obsessed watching it. I'm like, I got to try this. Opened up a spot right across the street, dedicated half of it to one of my, one of my uh, mentor, my grow mentors. He taught us how to grow his way. So half of it was that way. And the other half was R and D based on what I had seen on the forums and largely what I had seen Ivan do. Um, I, I watched Ivan from jungle boys on there doing a bunch of unique shit, trying new things. It was him and the other guy. I don't remember the guy's name that was doing deep water culture in the, in the home Depot buckets, the yellow tops and the, he'd do these massive plants with the vertical HPS is hanging down. And this is on IC mag. Yes. Jack yeah, that's what it was. Shout out, you know, yes, the original Jack jungle Mayhoffer. boy. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're watching these guys do that and you're basically specking out like, if you don't mind me asking, what strain did he, did he say like, here, you're going to grow this. So he, he was growing an OG, but OG was kind of starting to lose steam a little bit. It wasn't getting the crazy numbers and it was hard to grow, but he had this strain called the, gro uh, he called it the cross and it was supposedly GDP crossed with uh, OG fire it was super fire it was a short indica like plant when you got the color on it it was some of the most beautiful weed coffee chocolate noses and we dubbed it the godfather and a lot of people know about the godfather that was one of the first strains that had been named like something you know something out of california you know there's sour d and there was og that had been renamed and cookies wasn't around yet so it was the fucking godfather it was like one of the first strains and people were driving for miles to fucking pick up the godfather but only when we could 
when we could get it to hit right. If you didn't get it to hit and turn purple, it was like, hey, it was so crazy. The contrast between it was either insane or fucking terrible. It was super finicky. Some strains are like that. You literally, if you don't hit it out of the ballpark, it's not worth growing almost. And it's like, damn, you can get two batches a year out of the four or five that are like tens and the other two are nines. And you're like fighting it. Right. You know? Yeah. So, but you're learning this whole time how to grow. So we started R and D at my very first grow. Like it's just, it's ingrained in me. I never understand. It was. 36. Ooh, that's on a, a big first on a, grow. On a flip flop. 18 on one side, 18 on the other. Um, Plus a veg. Uh, a two light mom. We didn't have pre veg. So it was a two light, no, a four light, four 600s was the mom area. We could veg a little, but we couldn't veg enough for the whole room. Yeah, but that's a big grow, man. You, you jumped right in. Yeah. And. We just did that for a while. Then the federal crackdown happened shortly after that. We only had about a year there, a year and a half. And the feds started sending out the landlord letters. They sent one to our landlord and we had a really good relationship. And they're like, look, this is all we have. We can't lose this, you know, and they were starting to take some of them to court around that time and making it look like they're actually going to take the buildings. I think they ended up taking some in L.A. They make uh, the landlord flip on the actual person right. running the building by basically saying, we're going to seize the property. Right. Yeah, we're going to, you know, all these crazy charges and you just have to give it up. Yeah. So we, we didn't fight the landlord. Like a lot of people fought their landlords. I'm just like, it's not their fault. They were fucking stoked. I'm not going to drug drag these people through the mud. And so we closed that shop down and we bought into another one downtown downtown. It was called a therapeutic alternative. Um, we bought into that one and we were operating that and that, and by this time we had had two more grows because that one ended up getting busted just because, uh, we had, we put in a 250 breaker or a 450 amp breaker, I think. And it was only rated for 400 and we blew the, uh, transformer three times in like two and a half weeks. They don't like <laughs> smud and like that. And so we, uh, got, like, what are these guys doing in here? Yeah. yeah. It got raided. My boys, fuck, they had the, you know, the full SWAT team guns in their faces. And I happened because it was across the street from the dispensary. I saw it happening. Got on the phone with my lawyer, Mike, Mark Reichel, one of the biggest badasses in Northern California criminal law. I was like, dude, cause we had a sign in there that said, don't touch your shit. It's legal. So you're in there looking and you see cars just pulling SWAT up team fucking yes. bus. I'm like, fuck. And he fuck, he's like, I'll be right there. Gets in the car, drives down, fucking walks in during the raid. He's like, this is a legal grow. I'm not sure what you guys are doing here. Fucking got up in their face, fucking cited. Cause we had that Butte County case where they, the sheriffs tore down a legal garden and they lost in court and the sheriffs had to pay them for their fucking weed Hell because yes. it was legal and it was documented. It says, call this lawyer, verify, had the fucking agreement right there. Um, and they were so fucking pissed and they looked around, they fucking cut the power cause it was run. There was a code issue, but they left all the plants. We had another, uh, 60 lights by this time, right down the street, the same crew that had their guns put in their face that day. Fucking once the cops left, they went home, chilled for a couple hours, got a U-Haul, came back, loaded up the plants, drove it two blocks down to the other grow, and we filled the aisles worth. Hell oh, yeah. I, have you, a fucking, could, I had a fucking team. Could I you still say have a that team. attorney's name again, though? Mark Reichel. He, you deserve he a shit. massive shout out. Shout that out takes, to Mark, man. That for takes real. some serious uh, nugs. To Dude. get in there and be like, yo, during the on, fucking you raid. Know, and start telling 12 cops or 20 it just, cops. It just with goes guns. to show you how much is get being, how much they're, get, how much is being, get, you know, they're getting away with, with shit that oh, yeah. if he could come there and just stop all that one man, yep. stop a whole SWAT team, yep. a man that knows the law. With and it's warrant. just like the people not in the know, like you said, life's a game, right? You either play it or get played. Yep. And when you're not in the know, you you're fucking getting played like yep. that's crazy bro that's a crazy ass story 
Yeah, we were super lucky. I mean, he, the guy's just got balls of steel. He's represented some of the most notorious criminals in, in Northern California as a federal judge. And so he knows the feds. And I think when you operate at that federal level, you just like, you kind of look at local law enforcement through a different lens because you realize how the different power structures are and what they can get away with and what they can. And when he had the opportunity to work with local, uh, you know, officials, he's just like, let me just fucking piss all over this situation right yeah. here. Oh my God. That makes me so juiced up, yeah, man. That makes me want to start cool, fighting. Dude. I'm like, yeah, that's so sick. Yeah. He's become a pretty close friend. If you're in the Sacramento or Northern California area and you catch some heat, he is the fucking man to call. I'll tell you that. And he's crazy. He's like, he's, he seems a little disorganized. The dude's, he's like genius type. Just crazy. He's got everything up here. So you're finding these people. You're making these moves and you're playing this game. The plants go to the next grow and you just continue on. Did you guys shut down there? Yeah. Once a fed, once we got news, there was that, that, uh, there was operation disco days, big federal raid that happened in the Bay area and checked the names on the indictment. Didn't know anyone. Turns out we did. One of the electricians was, um, had done some work at our place and he was, had been trying to get a message to me through a few people. And I was like, eh, I didn't take it seriously. I didn't know that. I didn't recognize the name. That's what the thing was. And I was like, whatever. I don't, it's kind of hot right now. I don't want to talk to anyone. Finally, the message gets to me that the feds raided them, which we had nothing to do with that whole operation, but they had somehow knew he had worked with us. They're like, tell us about Caleb counts. Tell us about Eddie Barquette. Tell us about Anthony Barquette. Tell us about fucking all these people and started naming off two or three corporations that we had. And like he said, all they grilled him about was us. And he didn't know hardly anything about us. He knew where our two grows were, but that was it. They were focused on you. Yeah. Reichel was like, you're out of business in 24 hours or fucking you have a good chance of going to prison. What's it going to be? And fucking made the call. Fucking, I had 185 lights at that point. Um, what, called year, them. what year was this? 2011 um that's, that's we really that's only had shit. our first run at this game was really only two and a half years and then they shut us out before i reconnected uh before i connected with luke and lit back up the old space but i called <laughs> no my growers intended. i said every plant's fucking out of the ground every gram of weeds out of the dispensary in 24 hours we're out of business go dark and fucking just went dark three weeks later they the feds raided um El, El Camino Wellness, which was a very similar competitor. My lawyer's like, I'm willing to bet they fucking saw that you closed and just went down the list of 100%. I'm willing to, he's like, I'm willing to bet anything that that's what happened. You were smart by listening to me. You made the best decision ever. And I did because it, once again, it was another humbling event. Nothing can ever happen. We're f I'm doing everything right. I was doing news interviews. I thought I was doing it right because I was following rules and working with the city and the city wanted us there. Thought no way the feds would do that. They're going to go after all these other guys. And that's who they went after. That was the third federal raid. They luckily didn't send Sinead and Nick to prison. Is uh, the city uh, doing anything at this time? Are they standing up for they you and tried saying, listen, kind these of, guys are paying the us money. The power is just yeah. like, <laughs> step aside. Yeah. They just don't even care. The arrogance and the- The whole yeah. country's watching this on TV at the time, just so you know. Like right. all the growers in, in all the other states, right. I, everyone remembers it like, holy shit, do you see what they're doing out there? And it was during Obama. Everyone yeah. fucking gave Obama credit for being good on cannabis. He said a few friendly words that allowed the industry to blow up, but it was during his reelection campaign that the crackdown happened. There's that is no, not a coincidence. I just love man. And I got to bring this up again. You're playing this like a game. You literally say, okay, you got me right now. I'm going to take a step back. Okay. And, I, and not out, but I'm going to take a step back. Yeah. It's just this game. Most people would be like, I'm out. I'm done. I'm going to take an electrician position and I'm, you know, I'm moving yeah. on with my life. That's like the ultimate sellout, right? It's just like giving up on your dreams. There you go. Yeah. So that's a, that's a Love perfect that. lead in to how I, how I ended up opening things up. Luke Coleman, um, my partner, he hit me up. We weren't partners at the time. He hit me up. Cause things were chilling back out and I had been pretty much off, just completely off the radar. What was that I, like? Now, now you're getting humbled again. You know, the same exact people 
stuck with you. We're still there. Uh, a couple exceptions, not because they weren't friends, like a couple moved to the Bay Area, but my homie Brian, um, Hunter, and uh, Attila and Stephanie. Uh, Attila was new, but Hunter, um, Brian, and Stephanie had been my friends back then, and they were the people that stuck right with me. Um, Shout out to so real it was friends. E- it was easier this time. It was because you I, it was it was were. like, and they fucking. It was another test, and they all were like, "We're fucking right here next to you." Like it was crazy. It's it was super, super good feeling. So the humble, like, yes, I was humbled, but I was surrounded by good people. Support. I hadn't completely blown every dollar I had at that, and I was no longer spending like crazy. But I was reinvesting every fucking extra dollar goes back into more lights or a new s- new spot. It's humbled in a different way. It's humbled yeah. that. I have these people around me that love me enough to like show up in the middle of the night and help me break down a crow, even though they're not making money like I am out of it. And it's yeah. like, it's a different humbling, but it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. man. Killing it. Yeah. So um, experience at a thousand. Yeah. It was, it was crazy times. And I know a bunch of people in this, in this industry have crazy stories and actually got raided by the feds. Somehow we always, we caught that one raid by the locals that my lawyer pissed all over. And I literally, <laughs> just lost the spot but i harvested all the weeds still like unfazed so we always were able to and a lot of people had more balls than me and just kept plowing through and we're just like fuck the feds and i'm just like you played strategy yeah i i did and i slept good at night and fucking and i have no regrets because everything happens for a reason right if i had mm. not done that even if i'd made it through I wouldn't have met my partner luke and he came to me and he's like you got that permit let me let me buy it off you and at that time they were trading for like only 300 grand because of the federal intervention. And I was like, dude, I'd rather fucking die <laughs> as much as I could use this money right now. I'd rather die holding this fucking piece of paper than sell it because I know there's not an easy entry back into cannabis. It had already gotten into the hundreds of thousands of dollars to get in, buy something and if not millions. And I was like, I'd rather die. He's like, fine. How about we go partners? I'll put up all the cash. Cause I had literally t- Close the dispensary down. There's a, a storage space, uh, two spots down, a storage facility. Put all the shit, including the fire ass carpet that we had fucking put in, <laughs> in a storage unit, a block down. Fucking, he hit me and all the gross stuff. I just packed it all. I was like, I'm going to use this someday. I can barely afford these fucking storage units. I was paying for like nine storage units, but Luke came calling. I was like, cool. 50 50 plus you pay for me to, to build out the grow, you can run the shop. You're good at that. I'll run the grow. And he did it and we kicked it off. And, and that leads into like that. We opened back up in September of 2013 and we played it cool. We didn't do a lot of marketing. We want to see how it went. But when you, just so I can get this, did you guys say like, okay, here's our budget and this is our working out. Or was it like a, it was a handshake type of deal where you were just like, he's like, I'll, I'll put up the money and we're 50, 50 from here on. Like it was yeah, just it was that. definitely handshake. I mean, he asked me like, what do you yeah. think it's going to cost? Of course I was wrong by like yeah. fucking Millions. 50%. <laughs> um, but other than that, yeah, it was handshake. We just did it and fucking, um, and it was fuck. It was awesome. So we opened up and we played it kind of cool. I think around November, December of 2013 is when Burner started working with, this is the entry into like the cookie history. Burner started working with a group called the Cookie Co. in San Jose, and he was promoting their store. And they blew up super fast because Luke had a shop still at that time. I think Purple Elephant, which was kind of a famous shop in San Jose at that time. Oh, and the cookie, cookie Co. was his competitor. He saw them blow up when they started using Burner. And he was just always talking about it. I didn't really know who Burner was. I knew about cookies a little bit, the clothing line and the, and the strain. Then we saw Burner at, uh, at the High Times Cup in San Bernardino. And his brother went up, made an introduction, was like, hey, we got a shop in SAC. We're getting, getting another shop soon. Do you want to? Why I heard, you know, you did a deal with Cookie Co. in San Jose. We're not trying to do it in San Jose. Will you do it in Sacramento? And, and so Burner's like, yeah, I'll fucking, I'll rep your store. And, and what's it called at this time? Collective efforts. Oh, I remember going there. We both do. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Good collo- collective efforts. What an awesome store. If you are a part of that's that history. That's where the fire is in sack. Straight up. If you <laughs> don't awesome. know, then now you, well, you did know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, a, yeah. It was a minute ago. But, um, he, and so we struck a deal, uh, 
he posted us the next day after the contract was signed, our sales doubled our sale. He just, and all he said was, this is where you can get cookies, real cookies. And he helped us find some, some cookie packs and it just, we doubled sales the next day, doubled, doubled, doubled 30%, 50%. Like just, it just kept going. We were doing like 200,000 a month. We had just opened. We're kind of chill and it fucking went boom, 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 boom. It was just like just a couple of posts fucking exploded people driving from hours for hours and my partner uh luke and his brother they came up with the idea to do the cookie bags where it alternated the c with the word cookies um was a step and repeat or something what's that called and uh and fucking that exploded and people were collecting them and we started doing sports team colors and fucking people were selling the used ones on ebay used fucking <laughs> bags with nothing in them <laughs> nothing <laughs> they're like five bucks a piece and it just started exploding and th- with the equipment that was in storage, we built out a spot in Oakland. Was, so you're was, gr- was that the birth of the Mylar bags right there? Or the, the Yes. What yes. year was that? Do you think, do you know, like that was 2014. Wow. And no. that's the birth of the Shit. Mylar bags through. It was you guys putting the C on there. Yep. Correct. Yep. As the cookie. Yep. And I remember like the patterns and stuff. Yeah. And I think it was like bags. the first, one of the first branded ones. They had the mylar, just the bl- the pr- right, ba- right. basic ones, but, but no brand. It was like the first branded Strange ones specific. that really popped off. And then, like you said, you got into doing the different strain bags or whatever designs. People yeah, we would collecting do, we them. did the Kings colors for Sacramento. We did 49ers colors. We did Lake. I mean, people went bananas. What over are the, the pop and strains? Are you guys, you guys are growing them in house or what so are you at doing? At this point we were buying whatever we could get. We were buying as many types of cookies as we could get. Um, Home and grows, just, big grows all from everybody. Yep. Yeah, yeah, everything we can get. So we're, it was mostly cookies and purple a little bit. We always had to keep a few OGs on the menu. Um, but, it was just more about the hype. I mean, Luke always sourced really good weed. So the weed was always good, but it wasn't necessarily crazy or whatever. It was so clear watching it that it was about the bag and it was about what burner had created and the voice he had become as like the, the final word of what is good in Northern California fucking weed. Like he had, if he said it was good, it was basically what was happening at that time. And if this spot had it, whether it was real or good or not, that place blew up. He had a huge fall and does. So that worked really well. And I think like six, seven months into that relationship, maybe even less, we started, it was actually less. And then we started, uh, we had the grow in Oakland we were growing like OG rascals, white fire. Number three, we were growing. Um, it was a 43, right? White yes. Fire, 43. Yeah. Yeah. 43. Yeah. Well, there's no, we didn't have the 43 at the time. We had the three. Oh shit. So I even had the that. 43 and okay, Ivan's the okay. one who either popped that or was given that by OG yeah. rascal mm-hmm. and he had it and I wanted it. But, <laughs> uh, but the three was the one that was still kind of elite, but out there a little bit. Yeah. Big fucking yielding. It was awesome. I even even grew the three sometime. He would grow the 43 and the three, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yeah. Big shout out to OG Rascal. OG days. Those, yeah. Those OG Rascal, dude. Crazy. He isn't. That guy. If, if you haven't had him on, you guys need to have shout out to OG Rascal, to. man. We got to get an episode he, for He's sure. similar to you. He doesn't do a lot of media. He yeah. is out of the spotlight, but he's also infamous and legendary for creating absolute fire in the marketplace and empowering the growers like you guys do, man. Yeah. I, I've never, I've actually never met him personally, but I've got huge respect for everything that he's done. And, um, I've heard nothing but great things about him. Super into like snakes is Instagram. You'd think it's weed and it's like more like finding snakes in the wilderness. Poisonous and ones and shit. Yeah, he sounds oh, like a, shit. he's got to be oh, a yeah. super interesting guy. Yeah. Super interesting. So anyways, we're growing that. And then Luke's fucking hit up burner. He's like, why don't you introduce us to the cookie fam? Let's, let's get Sherbert. Let's get their cookies cut. And burner's like, all right, let me see what I can do. And he brokered a meeting with uh Jigga and Sherbinsky. Um, I wasn't there. My partners did it. Um, and they talked about like, you know, what's it going to take to, to get your genetics. We can buy them. We can do a licensing deal, whatever. Um, and they had just started to talk about gelato. Gelato had not even been released yet. They hadn't even found the phenos, but the breeding project had been done. And I think they were growing out the phenos. And so the conversation ended up evolving into let's do a licensing deal for Sherbert and 
and gelato and you they let luke come to a tasting party is probably one of the first tasting parties of its kind they had cards like you know review cards for the different finos and luke the 41 was already picked and then luke was allowed to pick three more he picked the 45 the 33 and the 25 holy shit hold on you guys need to understand how legendary this just is larry bird the larry bird the 45 which is just absolute one of my favorites and the what was the third one i'm sorry again 25 and the 25 which is that the acai no i don't know what he called it and and i don't know what your nickname yeah we it it took on the guava nickname for us then that's what it was it's the guava yeah the some of the most most legendary cuts and infamous cuts in all of cannabis i don't even yeah, I'm excited you even laying this down, bro. So this Just, was the famous gelato pheno hunt. Yep. Ooh. Out of a hundred phenos, they selected the top. Yeah, I don't ones. know how many they may have picked. Some they yeah. picked the 41 before that was even done. Yeah. They like knew it was a standout. Yeah, the boccio. So that was yeah, the boccio, and that was just like. But they boom. let you guys pick which ones you wanted. Yeah, Luke got to go to that pheno tasting event in um in San Francisco and and pick them and so he picked the 25 the 33 and the 45 i'm sure they had already kind of like pointed like hey these are potential good ones but he picked them and then we got to grow them and we just put them in rotation because at that time luke had only seen like a half ounce or a quarter ounce of each one so we didn't know which one was the winner so we had to grow it out we had to learn how to grow them some finicky bitches it was just different than anything. They ate totally differently than the Wi-Fi number three that we were growing and, and some of the other shit just ate differently. And, uh, and you're under Gavitas and stuff or. Yeah. Yeah. At our Oakland go grow, which a lot of people have come to learn as uh, know about as triple C that's the, that's the corp name, but uh, that place became infinite. It still is to this day. It's uh, it's our Oakland grow. Our first grow as a partnership still under operation. It's where, these phenos were grown um so sure sir so sherbinsky so so luke paid him like close to 100 grand for these cuts and and we wrote up a contract for a licensing deal for okay here's you know their side of the thing they had to supply the cuts and i think sherbinsky had to do like six posts a month for either the shops or or our, our grow account or whatever and jiga had to do four a month um something like that um and so they come and they drop off the cuts. He dropped off a lot of sherbet first because that's all that they had had because um, they didn't have the moms up of the gelato. So we basically filled at that time. We had 105 lights at the Oakland Grow and we basically filled it with sherbet and we started growing it. Um, but up until then, we had been buying Sherbinsky's sherbet and it was coming out of this 30, 30 or 36 light grow in Elk Grove metal building, five ton AC on a flip flop. like struggling out of this facility <laughs> especially sacramento gets out grows 110 degrees and you got a wood yeah. a, a metal building in a like, five ton on a flop that thing is running oh just cooking and he's trying to grow a purple strain you know but it didn't matter man that it didn't look the best people came in and bought we were buying it for 3600 a pound we took every pound put it in the sack in the in the sf shop and it would just fucking fly and it was not good look sometimes it would be decent it smelled really good Sometimes it was just so ugly, but if it, as long as it had 20%, 30% purple gradient on it, it flew, but you would get these batches that were solid green. And luckily they're few and far between, and we'd try to work with them. But once we did the deal and paid them all this money, you know, we, and now we're growing Sherbert, we don't need to buy, like, we're going to grow it better than you with that. We're hoping, you know, and we're doing it at scale. And Always the better. goal. Yeah. And and so things, so right off the bat, things things got weird quick in that deal. Um, Sherbinsky, uh, he was pretty cool. Sherbinsky was pretty cool, but and he made some posts and they helped. And, but Jigga was like, "I'm not making any posts." Like you literally just signed a contract where we gave you, you know, almost a hundred thousand dollars and a contract that can pay you close to that on a monthly basis. If everything is moving forward, all you have to do is post on Instagram. Wouldn't do it. 
because of you growing the flower so well that it dropped off sales for the other flower coming in? They didn't even have fly. They were Jigga. There was no cookies commercial production except for Sher- Sherbinsky's 36 like but Jigga wasn't growing and selling anything to our not to my knowledge at the time and so but no he was just like I won't post it like I gave you the cuts that's good enough it was this weird like pride I don't know what it was I wasn't dealing with him directly the light but, was getting shine pretty bright on you yeah but he's just like we're not posting and we're like but Sherbinsky would and my partner Luke is like we just gave you all this money this contract contempl- contemplates a lot of money you got to fucking perform. You have to post. And then, so they, they, we didn't get resolve it. And then Sherbinsky grows a super green batch, super green batch. And we, our first harvest was coming down in like a week. And he came to the store when Luke wasn't there and he sold 15 pounds at 3,600 a pound to his manager. And was like, oh, Luke said to bring him in or whatever. And the manager called Luke. He's like, I never said that. He's like, dude, we can't take your fucking green sherbet. It's not going to work. Like we got our own coming in and it's not good. If it was good, I could take it and I could move it. And your crop's coming in purple and you know what's coming. And he went down the street and he sold it to one of our competitors and then shouted out that competitor fucking on Instagram and hadn't done us for a while. And then Jiga fuck uh, shouted out the competitor too. And had never shouted out us. It's like, what in the fuck? And you had handed over a lot of money to them. Yeah. And that's how the deal broke up. It didn't even last that long, but we paid a lot of money. I don't think people were clowning us. The few people that knew were laughing at us for paying that kind of money for cuts. Like you paid that. It was unheard of. Like you paid that kind of fucking money. You're an idiot. It's fucking, it's not even worth it. I can get you this cut and that cut for fucking free. But you know what you had and you knew yeah. now I have the gas yeah. for the car and we're about to drive this thing yeah. home. So that that broke up that relationship where like we clearly can't, you're not willing to do what you just agreed to do. And um and we're gonna fuck we paid you a lot of money, we're gonna keep growing it. And so we broke up at that point, but we were still under a separate contract with Burner, the cookies licensing deal. And that that just kept fucking doing better and better for us. And we opened up San Francisco and we opened up Stockton and it just blew up those locations. The the Sa- San Francisco one is the one we actually called cookies. And um, it just became the spot. Like, is, that, is that the one that was on height or? Where, no, it's on mission. It? Mission. Yeah, yeah it's, it's on mission. mission. That was the one we used to go yeah. to. Yeah. Unbelievable store. Had the high tech. Yeah. You had, I mean, lemonade, all, the stuff. all that. Yeah. All that was popping. Yeah, in Luke the, in always, the, oh Luke knew where to source pins, the best shit. He had third, yeah, the, the, the sea balls. Yeah. Third yeah. gen used yeah. to come back. You'd have sea the balls. rosin. You guys had peach rings rosin. Remember that? Yeah. Before we were like rosin. Peach rings. I mean, you had hitting. stuff from like the guys in Humboldt would come down it was a direct yeah, to it was you. Real, it was right. real norcal bay area flavors yep. the staple if you were going to the bay you so went how, there. how did that deal work out that so that was how, how did that deal come together how did that work out did you guys go where you call the cookies the the cookie fam mm-hmm. so yeah. there's the cookie fam deal and then there's the the burner cookies deal the burner cookies deal where you call it yeah cookies. so for the dispensaries how did how did that how did you guys end up working that out so it was just a monthly fee. We started off Sacramento was like 5,000 bucks a month. And then we added Stockton and I think it went to 15,000 total, but none of those were called cookies. He would just shout them out. And then San Francisco, um, we called cookies and we gave him 25,000 a month to call it that. So I think between the two, he was getting like 40,000 and then we opened up a San Jose location. So he didn't have any ownership in that. No store. ownership. No. But a check every single single month yeah. and is he helping you support? and that's the first cookies dispensary well the one in san jose they called it the cookie co so technically yes the one in san francisco is the first cookies right they just bit off the name and called it cookie co and because they didn't want to pay for the cookies name um <laughs> that's that was what the word was so we paid we paid up to put the cookies name and yeah san francisco was the first true cookies dispensary yeah i think that was like the premier shop where it was like flavors and you know you that's that was a staple huge staple yeah uh people i still to this day people are telling me stories i'll see them all parts of the state and they're like dude i used to drive so far 
to that spot yep. to either get like some of the fucking shit that they were some of the concentrates southern humble concentrate what was it southern humble southern humble uh turp farm southern humble concentrates yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. they were that was the fucking jumping off the spot. skittles yeah for for those sh- that shit and people were coming from everywhere for it and then the gelato when she started dropping gelatos there it was our three shops were the only place you could get it for a long time um it was a scene too you park on the side of the street you walk down you go oh in you get, the parking like, there's a nightmare you guys it was like you were bumping some music it was just a vibe the yeah. whole thing was a vibe then you go back to your car roll up i mean the whole deal yeah, yeah. luke did a fa- fucking luke was killer at retail he did a fantastic job he just knew how to i mean his ability to run a permitted shop like a trap shop is fucking that's how i mean that's how you make it a vibe right it just feels like that when you fucking you just make it feel just super just authentic and you were on instagram early you had a girl taking photos of bud rotating yep in a small box by the front window like that was her duty like yeah yeah, Yeah. you make sure we're popping on instagram because we got fire coming in yeah so you'd walk in and look to the left and there's a girl taking photos and doing the whole and we're looking at it like holy shit you see this yeah like shout out to him man i mean you guys were way ahead of your time yeah yeah luke mastered social media marketing for fucking for dispenser like he knew how to get it popping his shops were never glamorous they weren't the build outs weren't spent a lot of we didn't spend hardly any uh towards the end we started spending more of our towards the end of our retail um building shit but he would just they were simple just get as many people in and out as quick as possible and whatever it takes to do that and everything else is a waste of fucking time and money and a waste of fucking space like he's he fucking knew how to do it you always have fire yeah he did so that god where do we go where does where does it go next after that so we kept doing and the store numbers of stores kept growing with burner and um we did a santa Ana one at, at some point we're paying the guy like a hundred thousand dollars a month just on a, just a check just for the name the licensing of the name and um but then he started out of nowhere one day he starts a fucking brand called exotics with ivan a competing like we're literally paying you we've got this other contract like we're growing the gelatos we're doing all this we're paying you and now you just started a competing flower company with someone who's giving you a hundred thousand a month and that's when the relationship we were like whatever we sucked it up still kept paying it because we we're fucking making money the name was fucking big I'll, I'll, i can't deny it the cookies name drew a ton of people to our retail and we're giving our our bags with the gelato and the sherbet credibility um and so our relationship kind of to sour t- started to sour after that it just was never the same he stopped promoting us because he's promoting other things and he was just doing other deals and and we got frustrated but it still didn't matter we had to have the name so we just kept letting it go and then one day i'm like we had a fucking oh so it was the biscotti i think the biscotti yeah the biscotti dropped first so luke one day is like so we got these gelatos we got a we've got to come up with the next best thing. Like we're in it. We can't ride these forever. Like people are going to want new shit. So we kicked off a breeding program and Luke had this grower, uh, his contract grower doing some stuff for us in sack. And he's like, start making some crosses, you know, and they made the cross, which ended up being the biscotti cross. Um, and it's, it was labeled RC 14, 25, 27 and 28. And RC stood for red cup because we popped the seeds in a red cup, old school style. Um, and Luke's had this idea. He's like, let's have burner promote it. You know, we have to, we can't just like pop off this strain and it's going to have no association with cookies. People are going to be like, what the fuck is this? You know? So we brokered a deal with burner, even though the, the relationship had already kind of, yeah, it was, but Luke didn't, Luke doesn't really give a fuck where relationships are at. I was always a relationship person. So I'd let shit get in the, I just couldn't even fucking, I just so mad that this, that these, the deal went the way, it, but Luke was like, whether he hated you or loved you, it didn't fucking matter. What's the straightest line to the dollar. And that's why he's so fucking, he was so good. I learned a lot from Luke in that, um, just take the fucking emotion out of it and just, get it done work with logic yeah and he did and he had the he was brilliant for him to do that so 
Burner came up with the name Biscotti. We selected the Finos. Um, we wrote a contract. We brought Jigga back in, gave him some back pay on some gelatos, said, sorry, you know, we, we want to make it right. And fucking basically caught up on the contract on his, what would have been his half, brought him back in. Wow. And we were like, yeah, let's wow. say you guys created Biscotti and fucking promote it. And it blew up. And it worked and we didn't care. We had no ego. We don't need to say at that time, we're like, we don't need to fucking take claim. It's better for our finances. If fucking they make take credit for it. So they took credit publicly online. And that was we, huge of you. Yeah. And we Just paid so them, we I mean, paid like, them to do it. It was my, it was my fucking partner's idea. And who it was really created biscotti. Then we did. You created biscotti. Absolutely. There we, we go. fucking I mean, created it without question. The phenomenal. They named it. They named it. They, they named, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking named it. Uh, it they was. Named it, I, I thought that. It. I'm like, what? Biscotti? It's a dry, Phenomenal flavorless name. cookie. <laughs> it's fucking <laughs> terrible. But when you say it, and it fucking wraps good, it's like. But when you say the biscotti, sounds fucking amazing. Yeah, but shout out you to Gunner. Actually, He's, he, bro, he loves using it. We gotta get into cookie. that too. We gotta get into a that. A dry, flavorless cookie. <laughs> Like the, dying. that's hilarious. It's exactly what no, you but, wouldn't want weed associated and with. It's, yeah. But when you smoke the strain and you, it, it makes total sense. And it's like, yup. Yeah, I mean, phenomenal, bro. Yeah. Phenomenal branding. This is the start of weed branding so, right here. We're hearing. Yeah, it was crazy. So how'd you guys work, work the deal with that? <laughs> so we paid them on a per pound basis uh, for a set amount of time. Um, there was an upfront fee. Luke was always smart too to get people really excited and bought in. He's like, I'll pay you six months in advance or 12 months in advance of whatever. Like, and then it's hard for people to say no for that. Yeah. You can say no to five, 10 grand a month when you're getting offered 50, 60 upfront. Like, even if you didn't want to do the deal, it's going to be a little hard when that's staring you in the face. Super smart tactic from him. Um, he would prepay back in the day. He would prepay for people's harvest. Be like, I'm fu- I'll give you the cash right now. I just need your weed. Like at any price, it was just, he had the mentality. You get the best. If you want the best, you got to get the best, whatever fucking method you it takes. It's super smart. Um, True so we business, did that man. and we just, we just grew it for a while. And then that was in 2016 that we launched, that we did the project and it's you could get a little bit of biscotti in 2016 but it was really sorry get out there in 2017 and that was right around the time when i started realizing i'm like look the 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 tension between we're paying this guy way too much for there to be this level of tension like he was starting to ask for equity in our company or more money and we're like look it's up to like 140 grand a month or something at this point like we're making a lot of money, but you're making a lot of money. Let's not, let's not screw this thing up, you know? And it just, uh, he just wasn't happy and he wanted to do a bunch of other things and which I respect. It's fine. Like, uh, we just needed to do what was best for us. And I can't, I told my partners, I'm like, we got to come up with our own brand. We have a year left on the contract with burner. No one knows who the fuck we are. We are responsible. We were, grew a hundred percent of cookies, commercial cultivation from 2014 to 2018. No one else was growing cookies were genetics you? and putting them in cookies bags with the blessing or like the verified genetics of, of burner um, and the people that, that created them. And so, but no one knew who the fuck we were and we had to take credit for that. So I was like, we come up with another company name change the packaging, but we let people know we started an Instagram account and let people know it's the new company. And I was like connected, like, you know, it works in so many ways. You got the fucking connect, you're connected relationship wise to people. Um, that did you take, did you labor over that for days or did you just sit there in a meeting and it just came to you? It wasn't even in a meeting. I was on Instagram and I had seen a t-shirt that I thought I read it. It was a dope shirt. I don't even remember the brand. And I thought it said connected and it didn't. I forget what else it, it just, cause it was old English writing. And I, and I was like, and I assumed it said connected. And I was like, connect, fucking connected. I'm like, that's fucking, that's fucking perfect. I'm like, and I was like, but for sure it's been taken. Has to be like, how could connected not be taken? Searched everywhere. Wasn't fucking, wasn't taken. And I was like, that's it. 
partners agreed on it, got the, the different logos drafted up, still the original logo that we came up with. Um, and so we started telling people and fucking Bernard did not like it. Um, but you know, he's still under contract and we were still paying him a bunch of fucking money. Um, and so he kept, he just kept on like, he wasn't pleased with it, but whatever. Did he keep promoting? No, no. By this time he had, uh, even before that, still paying him and he's, we're still paying him because we're using the name on the dispensaries. Um, and it had started to probably dwindle in value a little bit, but was still worth it for the most part. So we were still paying him and he had stopped promoting quite a while before that. Did he have any other retail platforms up until this point? No, no. Cause I think cookies Maywood was their first shop. Yeah. Shout out to the homies over there for real. Yeah. That was your good friend. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was his first shop and I don't think that was till like 2019 maybe. Um, so I don't think he had anything else going on. I could be, my memory could be missing it, but I don't think he had anything else going on at that point. Um, so the so name he was the face of, you know, the production and the retail that you and your partner, Luke are running, running this company, yep. which is now today known as connected. Correct. Wow. That's, I think that's going to be shocking for a lot of people to learn that. Yeah. That up until that point, really cookies is just a clothing brand. Right. Yeah, up until two thousand. I mean, Sherbinsky was selling Sherbert, but he wasn't. He didn't do it with any packaging, and I don't remember. He was like either part of the Cookie Fam or not officially, or I, I don't but know you the guys whole had story. Hundreds there. of lights up, and you had production. Yeah, we and only had one hundred and five lights so at that time because we had shrunk back down. I had torn all that down. We had one hundred and five lights, so a hundred percent of Cookie's commercial production from two thousand fourteen to probably two thousand sixteen was 105 lights. Then we got another 135 in Sacramento, another 48. Um, How do you find the growers to run these? They have up, up until like a couple years ago, it was friends, friends who I found that construction, anyone who's done construction is a can has the ability to be a damn good grower. I don't like mm. hiring other growers. No offense, uh, no offense to all the growers, but everyone's got their own methods and whatnot. You take a hardworking motherfucker who can work out in the sun and the elements and you put him indoors and like he's in a climate controlled and he's fucking doing super cool shit. There's some risk involved. So it's kind of cool, but our, the best people, some of the best people in our cultivation program up until like now you can bring people in from like, you know, right. colleges and shit. No, but you're but a, before that is fucking the construction guys, dude. If you can hack it on a construction site, fucking grows yeah. a piece of cake. My mentor is a construction guy. Yeah. That's so hilarious that you say that. Yeah. 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 Makes and it's sense. some and of it's, the best guys I've ever met. Yeah. Like, and and it's, they it's can happen to fix shit and like grows always needs something fucking. And they yeah, just so happen handy. to have a fucking tool belt. <laughs> it's a system thing too it's like everything's has its place and everything's nice and neat and at the end of the day you clean up and at the end of the you know what i'm saying like it's yeah. very like military yeah. the way job sites are run yeah. and they get trained that way so then in the grow it's the same thing yeah the good trash the bad trash the da, da, yeah. you know it's everything has its place yeah man you hit that nail on the head so much they know home so people you'll like hire, the back of their hands yeah <laughs> <laughs> you go. Like, oh that's in aisle fucking a6 yeah, yeah no problem yeah. that's yeah. 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 people run and they're they're there and back someone yeah. has never been and it's gone for half a day you're like you oh half fuck stone out. you get lost and fucking and so you got a phone. construction a, a very competent construction guy right who does electrical yeah. and then you got a guy who's a grower you're gonna hire the construction guy right now yes 100 gotcha. percent. right now it's a little different i'll still hire the construction probably not to be a gm because now you can get people with grow experience in like a legal you know because you got to have it's not just how do you grow the plants it's the fucking how do you run a team of people and yes. not get fucking tripped up by hr how do you uh how do you um the compliance and regulation is an entire clusterfuck you know mind fuck all of itself but the gm's got to know all of that so it, it's a different but the guy who runs our best spot right now uh comes from can he's my buddy from high school hunter and fucking he's growing connected's absolute best fucking weed and uh, stole him from from a construction site. Man, so. shout out Hunter. So it's yeah. not this or that; it's both. Yeah, and everyone yeah. has their place, but shout out Hunter. That's huge. Yeah, he's been putting it down for a long time. Hell yeah. 
That guy's been through all the craziest shit. So with all us. the names start to get changed over connected, 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 connected. Yeah. And all the shops and the branding, and you start jars. What, or, what yeah. happened? The deal ran yeah. out. You were still paying. What what ended up happening? So the deal had like 2017. Uh, yeah, the deal went into 2008. I think it ended in 2018 or 2019. So we kept paying until the end of the contract and uh, just decided to, to part ways. Which is good business. Yeah, yeah. Honestly. Yeah. You know, that strategy. It's like you said, your your partner think logic over emotion. And then logically, that's the sound decision. Yeah. If you're running a company yeah. that large, you know, finish the contract and pay it out and then move on. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And they um look and it's like a super beneficial thing for both sides like cookies has grown gone on to be this huge fucking company they're in all these states like you know we weren't a hundred percent responsible for for them being recognized as a weed brand but we played a pretty big role in it right we made a lot of money connected would not be where it was without that relationship so there's no there's no hard feelings luke and burner are still friends and uh, there's no hard feelings. It's like it's business and all cohesive. And, and we both like benefited significantly and are in a better place because of it. So uh, there's no reason for any negativity on, on our side whatsoever. Awesome, bro. Yeah. I love that. Very logical. As it's switching over and you're telling the team and everything, how's everybody's like morality and stuff? And like, what's the plan moving forward now? That People were fucking nervous. Up? People were super yeah. nervous because, I mean, that was our identity. Someone else's identity was our identity, but cookies was our identity. And like, not everyone knew how that would play out. Um, but I just knew it would. I just knew like we have this opportunity. We have the rest of the contract for them to for for us to be like hey just making it very clear connected's growing the weed for fucking cookies and so if you like it like that's us pay it to you know and and slowly started telling our story but really through the weed just letting the weed speak for itself we we ramped up the uh the breeding program and i think right around that time i think 2018 was when gelinade got dropped and that was our uh, so there was biscotti and and gushers and then gelinade um was our next big one and lemon tree times gelato 41 and and it fucking you know we hit it we hit another one Damn. it did it hit a totally different right? uh Damn. genre too you know um, it's crazy too cuz the lemon tree just like disappeared yeah but that's fucking that's amazing yeah we were and then you know and then our breeding program really became the focus um you know we were pretty active on instagram but we weren't you know using any you know we were on our own now you know it was up to us and so it was up to us to keep putting out hitters and the breeding program just kept going into overdrive uh it was right around the time. I think Gelinade dropped right around the time where we forged the the stronger relationship with Alien Labs. Um, Alien Labs, a lot of people know some of the story, maybe not all of it, but we met Ted and Tyler. They got an introduction to me through one of my friends. They and I didn't know it for a long time, but they paid this girl I knew a thousand bucks to give them an intro to me because they wanted to sell weed. Uh, our buyer would never buy their weed, and they wanted Damn, to sell on to, you, Ted. <laughs> they, wanted to sell, <laughs> they wanted to sell to our our fruit ridge shop, and I took the meeting. They were cool as fuck. Their weed was fire. Ted um, is cool as hell. You meet them, you feel like you've known them forever. Yeah, if you yeah, click yeah. with them. It was just like, man, I'd fucking kick it with these guys. Yeah, great brand and great strains. Yeah, and I and I loved what they were what they were doing. I'm like, yeah, let's let's give it a try. Let's do it. Um, they took me to sushi, and uh, they're like, where where's the best spot? I'm like, oh, we got to go to cruise, dope sushi spot. Sat down. I was like, oh, you know, you get the this and all. I knew all the specials to get, and they're like, yeah, I just order whatever. Like, so we'll have whatever you're having. And I got all this crazy sushi, and I just watched <laughs> these two boys from Reading just like. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm just fucking eating, and they're I was just the like, first time they sushi. literally didn't even fucking. They're like, 
Yeah, we're good. It was straight sliced <laughs> raw fish. The whole yeah. yeah two yeah. boys from Reading were like, yeah. <laughs> I think Tyler like had one of them. And they're like, oh, I'm not really hungry. It's good <laughs> whiskey. They started drinking at the table, and so I agreed to carry their products. And we built this relationship. And I was trying to get as much as their weed as possible for our shop because it would sell super fast. He was doing a really good job on social media, driving the hype, and. Do you remember you, what year this is? So right, when it you, is like 2017. Okay, yeah, it was 2017, and um, I remember calling Ted out. I'd be like, "What the fuck, dude? Like, give us more weed." He's giving us like six at a time or ten. He's like, "Dude, you're getting almost all of it." I was like, "Yeah, fucking right." I know you guys got a big old warehouse. I'm getting six of this, that. You're full of shit. Ended up finding out later they had 60 lights spread across fucking. Uh, six different garages in Redding, California, and they had made themselves look so big online and come off. So it was just incredible to see that and then learn. But we kept building it and building it, the relationship and get as much as we could. And then 2018 comes around. I'm like, what's your guys plan? They're like, fuck, we got no nowhere to go. Like no permit. Like, I'm like, man, we got a spot. We can fucking put you under. We'll give you full autonomy. You can do whatever you want. You're, it's our employees, but you become, you give them the instructions. We'll buy your nutrients. You bring your cuts down. You do whatever. And you grow in our thing. It'll be a licensing. We'll pay you a, a per pound fee and let's kick it off like that. See how it goes. So we did that for like a year. And then we had uh, negotiated a deal, kind of sort of pre-negotiated a deal to, to buy them. Um, or to bring them under the connected umbrella. And so it took another six months or so to negotiate. And then we ended up acquiring alien labs in, I think 2019. Yeah. I think the summer of 2019. Um, and fucking Ted's on, you know, Ted's my partner. Ted's fucking part of the family now. And, uh, they're a big part of, of the company and absolutely they're, I mean, alien labs, like you don't talk about California cannabis culture and not mention alien labs. percent. And same with connected together. It's almost like hand in hand. Right. Uh, uh so awesome. yeah, go ahead. So, so to clear the air, Ted didn't have anything to do with the, the cookies or the Sherbinsky thing. No, or, like we, we didn't, we got to clear Ted up, man. Yeah. <laughs> He had nothing. He, he didn't even know it was going on. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, other than he knew no more, no more than anyone else. That, right. I mean, a fan was, of what you were doing and yeah, all that. Yeah, yeah. 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 He had no idea. He had no involvement in that. Ted's whatsoever. a good guy. When Ted first came through with alien labs, you remember what strains he was bringing to the table with you guys? As yeah. far as like, what is it? The, it was do -si do. They came with the lemon fuel. -si. Um, Great they were strain. growing sure. They were growing a different 33 than most people so they brought that to um fuck, i'm blanking on what some of the no, other no ones worries were. history he'll, i just like to know that heavy stuff for sometimes. that but it'll i'm sure it'll pop into my head but. so you opened up did you say hey you can grow some of our strains or no you grow your strains here and you do your thing so we had d just done the th uh third or second or third round of our breeding project and we had crossed the 41 to almost everything and the 25 to a few things smart and so we had all these different crosses and so basically had just started doing pheno hunts and let ted um pick uh some different stuff and that's where 80 area 41 came out of that program um baklava came out of that program a couple others that have come at galactic gas which has come and gone so um and now of course we're one breeding program um there's definitely an alien direction and a connected direction but uh ted calls all the shots for all alien crosses all alien moves like we truly did like a lot of people a lot of brands are getting snatched up and the founders are just getting pushed out yeah. you know and it just made no sense to me. Like I can understand the motivation f to people that don't get how cannabis works and how, if you don't have the founders, like <laughs> a brand will fucking turn to dust overnight without the direction of, of the founder. The like no one's going to fucking take it and run with it because something different cannabis culture, cannabis customers are different than almost any other. I cannot find a parallel where the customer acts the same. Like if they feel like the true, customers the customers that care and pay attention about the brands like if they sense a lack of authenticity or bullshit or feel like they're getting fucking over marketed 
they'll fucking walk and never come back. And people can feel that. So we're like, I just saw no point in that. So the only way this works is if Ted, the pain in the ass as he can be sometimes, <laughs> if Ted has full <laughs> fucking control, it's the yeah. only way it's going to work. And it mm-hmm. fucking works. And we really operate like two different companies at, within a lot of capacities because it has to be that way. Because if, if connected started over heavily influencing, it wouldn't be alien labs anymore. I have yeah. a question. So a lot of times in cannabis, when you have two different brands, right. And they're trying to come together and figure out some way to work together. The hardest part is the paperwork or making a deal, right? Because it's like, are you going to mess with me? Are you going to fuck me over? Yeah. Am I going to fuck you over? How is this not going to work? How did you guys find that medium of like, did you guys say like my lawyer will talk to yours? Like, cause you, you obviously coming from the grow side, coming from the side you came from, you made him a fair deal. That was like, let's meet in the middle. This is what I'm going to give you. Did you make a whole paperwork and send it to his lawyer? Or was this just like a handshake? Like, this is what we're going to do. No, by this time, like handshake deals were done. done right? They were unfortunately, cause I've never had a problem with the handshake deal in the cannabis space. Never. I love hearing I've that. I've only Jeez, had man. problems. The first two deals we did with contracts um, are in legal disputes. See, and that just shows you, the man. The first time wow. pen touched paper for fucking me and Luke, legal disputes. It's fucking terrible. It's like saying someone who I would shake my hands with and get into business with is a person that... I would bank a lot more on versus someone where I need to have a contract, not to say don't have one, but it's just yeah. a different style of like jumping into bed with somebody. Yeah. 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 I mean, our, our first major investor, we never signed one thing and he's like not from the cannabis space. He's from the the oil business and we never signed one fucking piece of paperwork and he just trusted us. And that deal has been super beneficial. He's been a partner in multiple things. He's one of our largest shareholders now. Um, and fucking, we never signed one fucking thing with him, man. Shout out to uh, you, big dog. How are you, how are you able just for all the like young entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs mm-hmm. in general, how are you able to navigate, like getting a relationship to that status and establishing that? So this is, I, you, a you ask, that's deal, a great that's, question. It's all goes back to your fucking reputation. Like it it really does. And how he found us because we were killing it as operators and we did what we said we were doing, we were going to do. And he found us that investor Damn. found us because he had bought that San Francisco so dispensary. You. Yes. All of our good, all of our good partnerships, our second largest, uh, shareholder partner um who's the landlord at our stockton dispensary they found us i came in there was a fucking business card at my dispensary one day they asked around they asked who's the best who's on the up and up and fucking you do good work by good people and you fucking it pays you back you your be- reputation is paramount so any younger mm-hmm. do not sacrifice your reputation you're looking to build something take risks but only at the expense potential expense of yourself not at anyone else you fucking take everything on the chin and you own up to your mistakes and fucking your reputation will rise so fast and and reputation has taken me i've had people now give me millions of dollars on handshakes like deals and and they didn't fucking do that because I'm a good looking, nice guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is for damn yeah. sure. I love it. It's because they asked around and everyone came to the table yeah. every time they asked and said, he's a solid individual. He's a solid individual, you know, in a hundred different ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, that is unbelievable to hear as far as for young guys to just know that lay it out in front of you, do the right thing. Yeah. Epic. Yeah. And so you, you and Alien Labs forge this deal. And you guys start to just beat your drums, basically, because, yeah. I mean, look at everyone coming to the table now. Investors, you know, Connected's the, you know, NorCal brand. When we, we used to fly out here, we would like it was like, we have to go there and then we'll figure out the trip. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, for real. That's awesome. I yeah. Love hearing that. I mean, because you guys represented growers. You guys were literally sourcing product from the biggest names of the underground. Right. That was like. You know, that's just like some real grower love we, shit. Yeah. You know? We we brought units a few times to that shop on Burners on Height. Really? And it may have been your partner. I, I don't know. Whoever was running the shop or whatever that was the buyer. Um, we fucked with them a few times. It was good. 
But yeah. it's just crazy looking back because I'm like, damn, I thought that was, you know, I, this whole time I thought that was Burner Shop. So it's just. Oh, are you, hold on. Are you. T- so the first collective, uh, the collective efforts on mission where is or the. No, Cookies on Mission. Yes. But then there was Burners on Hate. That was his shop. But he opened that up much later. Got exactly. No, that opened like I'm a talking couple. about the mission when the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the, the lemonade. Got, got yeah, 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 the first that. one. Yeah, that was the thing. Let everyone make yeah. everyone think. Everyone thought Collective Efforts was his. Stockton Patient Clinic was his and, and the cookie shop and on mission. That was what made it work, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's how you found out about it. Yeah. But you had no problem stepping out of the limelight and saying, yeah, yeah, that's uh, we're just doing our thing. Like oh, a lot yeah, of people yeah. would want to be like, oh, I, I need to be on stage with him. No. You know? No. Yeah. So so fast forward it to now, 2019, 2020. How are you? How are you guys? You know, growing and operating as a company. Like, how did you learn how to take it from like the streets and really make sense of it? You know, on a a legitimate business level. You know what I mean? That that jump of like, you know, like all right, well, we have to do. You know, you're already doing it right and up until this point, but you know, like taking on money and hiring on more staff and building the company. I feel like that's where a lot of people kind of get held up or struggle or never make that leap. Right. And yeah. what was that like? You know, how did, how did you navigate and, and your partner handle it, you know, to be able to make that happen so that you could grow and, and be a big company, you know? Yeah. That was, that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to go through and do one of the, one of the craziest emotional roller coasters. So when we in 2000, late 2018, earlier 2019, when we were ready to, um, to try to fundraise, the market was going crazy. People were getting crazy valuations, but we hadn't been organized. Um, you had to like, we were a bunch of different LLCs and nonprofits that we hadn't even combined, which you would have to do, uh, in order to raise money. So we started doing that. We started going out and talking to people and they're like, you're worth this and you're worth this. You could be worth billions by this. <laughs> went up to fuck, you know, had the guys, uh, some of the guys from Canada come down. We went to New York to some of those investor, uh, setups and people were fucking blowing smoke up our ass left and right. I mean, you know, and I, I, I can't lie. I was like counting the fucking chips already. I'm like, Oh my God. Guys but taking out the nice had, dinners and like, yeah, oh, oh we're going to, thing yeah paint you this picture of what could be yeah yeah okay. and then and then you like get in you get in the fucking in the ring with these guys and you start <laughs> you know i mean you know they're sitting there and they're nice and they're light blue button up shirt and then but you're actually get you're getting close to a deal and then they just start chiseling and going crazy and you know i at this time we had a ceo we had hired a ceo um he came from the tech world's And, you know, he had had some experience with fundraising and whatnot. And so him and his team were, some of it had come from Uber as well. So they had been in, not to compare ourselves to Uber, but they had been in some fast growth companies and knew how to kind of navigate this stuff, knew some traditional investors and and man, we got fucking chewed up and spit out. Like it didn't matter what experience anyone had. We went into these, this fucking into the ring with these guys and and by the time you're done and they've chipped, whittled you down to almost nothing and you've kind of like stopped talking to other people and it's taken a while to hear the, the final numbers of far cry from where it started and you need the money at that point. So we took on some money. I think our first fundraiser was like 25 million and that was in 2019. Um, and, and we went and we tried to run with it, but man, I, we were good. We, when we started to suffer as a company, the first time was when we tried to get do too many retails. At one point, I think we had seven and in running seven retails throughout the state was a struggle. Like three was like our sweet spot. When we got beyond that, it was super hard, um, super hard for us to do with our experience. And, um, and you, then it grows the same thing, mm-hmm. right? Right around three, it started hard to get to like three different spots. It kind of became hard to like get the the trim cruise timed right, and like just having you know that many experienced people, you know, trained up, and they need two of you, yeah, and two of Luke, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, you know, it was we didn't know what to do with the money. We're trying to spend our way out of our problems, and. 
you know, we went down the same road, a bunch of, uh, a bunch of other cannabis companies did who got given a bunch of money, um, with all this, you know, all these investors just throwing at you, the, they believe in everything. And the story we spun up, we believed of why we thought we, you know, we deserve the money and what we're going to do with it. But it's a lot different world when you have it and you're like trying to spend it and you're trying to budget it. And you still didn't have good talent of it. Like the early to uh, early legalization, 2018, 2019, there was not, a, it was not easy to find good people with experience running you know, hundred million dollar businesses. It just, there's, they weren't willing to work in cannabis yet. And so we struggled through all that corporate shit, man. We've been through all this, all the stories you hear about different corporate, you know, spending money and hiring people from outside the industry and making all the mistakes that a lot of people talk about. We made all those fucking mistakes, you know, and all this business without banking. Yeah. Oh God. This whole thing that you're saying with hiring and CEOs and taking on money and this is without banking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unbelievable. Our banking is so weird. Like one bank, like won't accept, like we can't make deposits unless they come from a wire and this other bank, we finally got like a, it's a, it's a patch together system where the highest fees and the, the most ridiculous level of service, like not in a good way. And, uh, (laughs) But it's there. But yeah. Wow. I mean, we've been through everything, man. But, but once again, it's like another one of those life lessons, those humbling events. Like, don't forget where you came from. A little reminder to, uh, of, to rem- remember some of the lessons you've learned previous. It's not the exact same thing, but you can find similarities in your mistakes sometimes. And it's, and you get reminded of those if, if you don't remind yourself. And, um, so we've been humbled a couple of times at Connected. We're we're super stoked that our reputation, you know, has has been able to survive what it is and but it hasn't been easy and anyone thinks, you know, competitors or potential business people that it's like all like that it's been super easy or simple and it's been a fucking grind to get to get where we're at. And every day, every day we're fighting a new battle. Um, really don't in the weed business, we still, we don't have a lot of allies. Most cities are not our allies. Most people don't want to help us. Most people don't want to see us succeed or they want to tax the fuck out of us and put the cannabis tax on us at every angle. It's just the, the treatment we get, you know, from a tax perspective, from a regulation perspective, it's, it's laughable. And, and we just keep getting second rate you know the industry as a whole and fucking so anyone who's in it especially in california knows it it's a fucking grind every day no matter how much you're selling your weed for no matter how many pounds you're growing no matter what your ebitda fucking is it's a fucking battle every day so i I got a hell of a lot of respect for people in the california business everyone at every level that is still operating today and still fucking putting out product because i know that they're fucking getting kicked in the teeth constantly it's it's crazy being a fan of connected and the guys with home grows the small guy who comes in and buys an eighth they don't see that they're like, man, these big guys up here, right? Like not looking down on you, just that could never happen. They're so big. Right. It's great for people to hear that, man. Not in a negative way towards you, just oh, in an yeah. inspirational way for them to be like, I felt like that was me with two lights. It never fucking ends with problems. It's them with thousands and with businesses. It never stops. It's just how much are you willing to take on? Right. And yeah. and how much God will give you. Right. So, yeah, man. Yeah, and also I know I speak for so many of us. God damn, we miss those two fifteen days. <laughs> yeah, for real. Oh my god, if we would have known how good we had it, like I mean, we did and we didn't, but whew, it almost wasn't our nothing. choice. I mean, this is crazy. Like I felt like the vote was not in our hands. Yeah, we I voted the other way. I right. did not vote for it. Like you know, and it just went. It was just like, oh, there it goes, and there it goes. Yeah, and there's no going back. So, but. Where does it go from here? Yeah, 2020, what was it like going into COVID? And then talk about some of the bigger, you know, collaborations you guys are responsible behind. Even, you know, talk about the the alliance with Travis Scott, Cactus Farms, maybe. Right. Astro World. I know Big Ted was there when that went down. I had to hit him up and and be like, yo, what's good? I heard the news. That's gotta be crazy. Yeah. 
It, it was. So, so COVID hit and we didn't know what to think. Um, I didn't, I certainly didn't anticipate what happened, which business went through the fucking roof. I just, I didn't see it coming. Uh, I get it from the stay at home, but I didn't see all that stimulus coming. I didn't think it was going to come like that. And God damn, I mean, you know, if you've ever been in the dispensary business, you know, your best days of the year, I think are like the day before Christmas, 420, and the days. And then after that, like the days before any holiday weekend, but God damn, I've never seen a day like stimulus <laughs> check. <day. laughs> that was, we Holy absolutely shit. with the days, those, the 12, I think it was the $1,200 check something like that or 2200 or something if you're fucking married when that shit hit lying out the fucking door people were bragging about fucking they're gonna spend their whole thing we had multiple people spend the whole stimulus check the day they got it they were coming out over like a four or five day period and that shit the block was hot that fucking week, dude. <laughs> Holy, Holy fuck. Had all we had all time high sales on one of those days above 420, above fucking Christmas. All, all time, time ever. Ever. Yeah. Oh, wow. It COVID was fucking stimulus. Crazy. So I'm saying shout out to Trump, man. <laughs> really that shit happen. So, so what happened though? So we saw all that. It's, you know, wherever there's all this talk, everyone's going to work from home ever. And it makes sense why people are smoking at home. You can still work when you smoke. Can't really drink too much from home and yeah. get on a Zoom call. You're yeah. gonna, that ain't going to last. <laughs> well, you can smoke, you know. Yeah. And, and so just like a lot of us, we thought, you know, we were all short on weed. Everything's yeah. flying out the door. Think it's Stock never going to end. Let's build out more. Everyone's <laughs> building out lights. And then you have the fucking great. What are we? What's this going to be known as? The what happened Dude, this summer? It's the, the same thing that's happening this, in crypto. The great flood. The yeah. great flood, the great flood, but the collapse. Boof. It was yeah. flood plus collapse at the yeah. same time. I mean, obviously, a flood creates that, but it yeah. just like the house of cards fucking market came down. Like, yeah, it's like the karma or the what is it? The yin and yang, right? It swung so high up, it like swung back the other yeah. way now. We're literally in the opposite. I think, of I think COVID. summer of 2020, everyone in cannabis thought they were going on their way to being billionaires <laughs> yeah. next year. Yeah. T summer of 2021, <laughs> everyone starts realizing, yo, they're, they're like, it's, it's crashing. You yeah. Know, and it feels like crypto and fucking weed prices go hand in hand. <laughs> a thousand percent. I put on my Instagram, I'm like fucking crypto's the new crap the new trap like tell me i'm fucking wrong like crypto is definitely the yeah. new trap at least for now i mean obviously uh it's got other utility but it's just crazy how it's how it's ma mimicking the same kind of behavior but um yeah and so everyone's fucking hurting and everyone's like when's it gonna end like you know what do you think and I, I think we've probably another 18 24 months because a lot of people have to, unfortunately, like I don't wish this on anyone, but a lot of people are going to have to go out of business. That's the only way that this market stabilizes um, and gets back to any kind of norms. A bunch of people, probably 70, 80% of the producers have to go out of business. And uh, yeah, I think people have come out of retirement so they can, you know, I mean, it, everyone jumped in. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So we're just seeing a lot of changes. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's cannabis has never been, there's never a dull moment. There's always a hurdle. There's always a challenge. There's always something you cannot fucking believe is happening. Like how did they just raise taxes again? You know, the cultivation tax, it's just like, how is that possible when we're literally all just crying, like fucking tears of <laughs> tax death and then it gets raised it's just it's tone deaf in california but we're in arizona which is a fantastic market to operate in reasonable and relatively lax regulations um just like business friendly and we fucking crush it our business in, in arizona is just like it's on autopilot i mean not to say our people don't work hard but the the allowance of multiple activity or license types being able to be under one roof and share one set of bathrooms and one break room the fucking novel idea you know uh makes things super efficient the the quality 
you know, speaks for itself because it's like the, the quality is one of the hardest things to maintain in the California market because of all the timing and the testing and the, and the packaging and the, and the metric and like the, the burden that is on you to get your product to market <clears throat> makes it challenging for a, a product that's fucking losing, you know, is breaking down THC and every day it's, it's, it's a perishable item. So uh, Arizona is amazing. Uh, I'm super stoked to announce we just signed our Florida deal yesterday. So we will be in Florida. Um, hoping, hopefully, we'll have plot product drop in towards the end of summer. In wow. Florida. Connected. Congrats. Connected in Alien Labs. And we'll, Alien Labs. Absolutely. Wow. Congrats, man. For real. Yeah, We're it's Florida a natives deal. too. Do you so know what no. part of Florida? Do you mind announcing where? I believe the grow is in Tallahassee. Ooh, right in the capital. I think so. I think that's right. So is that where the shop's going to be then? Somewhere near no, that? the shops are spread. We will not be a connected or alien shop. It's just going to be, we're going to be growing out there, um, but it has to go. Um, oh, I won't announce who the, who we're working with out there. We'll wait for them to make the announcement, but it has to be in, in there. We're operating under someone else's license. So it has to be under um, their license. You're so. going to love some time in Florida, man. I'm looking forward Even to just it. Just for just to hang out. You're gonna love it. Yeah, I haven't spent a whole lot of time there. I hear nothing but good things. And yeah, I love it. They love good weed, so it's it's like sister states. Yeah. What, what was it what was it like going to another state? You know, what was that like getting into Arizona and and hopping over there and and being like, all right, now it's it's bigger than just California and uh I mean Arizona is somewhat similar to California in terms of, you know, they have a lot of dispensaries, nowhere near as many dispensaries, but it's not a limited license state, right? right? It's a little bit more open. There's, there's competition out there, nowhere near California, but you know, it's kind of free how to operate. So, um, but then you just go look at what's there and what people are selling. There's a couple good yeah. growers, but yeah. they're not super big. And, and you just see what the competition is just like, you're licking your lips. I mean, if you fucking, if you can make it in California, if you could sell yeah. your weed at the top of the market yeah, in California, you, seasoned. you fucking sell yeah. weed everywhere else should be a cakewalk. That's in one the of world. the things. Did that open yeah. up your mind of like, you know, much bigger thoughts when you came in Arizona and it was like a lot more lax and easier to like pull off what you know you can do yeah it, i gotta be honest like wanting to like just dominate california i realize is a little bit of a pride thing and we're not in this to fucking yeah i, I don't need to be the king of california i just want to fucking build the best company and grow the best weed where it's wanted and fucking sell a fuckload of it um while all while maintaining our quality through scale and that's that's what matters to me and when I'm able to think clearly about it. And so, yeah, boom, Arizona, where else wants it? Like East coast, you know, Arizona is an, an, a relatively easy jump. You know, our culture fuck yep. bleeds right over the border, state. but pr we'll prove ourselves. We're going to have to prove mm -hmm. ourselves on the East coast. I mean, I'm sure people have heard of mm -hmm. us, but nowhere near as many people as on the West coast. And it's going to be some of the most expensive, if not the most expensive weed in the state. And uh, we're going to have to fucking prove it. But, we think, you know, we, of course, the first phone call we had, they're like, there's no way you're going to be able to sell weed for 85 and eighth in fucking Florida. No way. A hundred bucks an eighth in Florida. And we're just like, I mean, we'll see about that. Like, How many other yeah. times in your career have you heard that you guys won't be, you're not going to be able to, yeah. I mean, dis distros were infamous for that. Oh, the changeover to two fifteen. You won't be getting $60 an eight. You won't be getting those 4,000 a pet, you know, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, my whole life. I think that <laughs> I think that started in like, you know, in in first fucking grade when I was constantly getting my name on the board. You're not going to go anywhere in life. You're going to be a loser. You're going to be all through my football coach. You're going to be smoking fucking joints down in the riverbed. It's like a Saturday <laughs> Night Live skit. <laughs> Guys just screaming in down my face. By the spittle, river. spittle fucking oh. coming off his mouth. You're going to be a fucking loser. <laughs> Just like I love looking back now at all the, all the people that said you can't do it. I mean, they said we couldn't sell at that price in Arizona, and we sold it, and we sold out all the time, and and some of our costs went up. We raised it up a little bit. Like it's all about commanding the most price, but it's about like being 
uh, compensated for your work and your quality. And you got to look at what it's sitting next to. And, you know, I think it's been very interesting because, you know, we were a Northern California brand first. Then we, uh, then we spread out into Southern California. I should tell that story real quick. Like how we started, yeah. Uh, yeah please how do. we started when we started vending outside of our own stores. Um, when we were growing the gelato and the sherbet, we're like, okay, this works in our own shop, but we've got the cookies hype directly. Like, will this weed sell for elsewhere before we scale, you know, these grows? And so we analyzed very carefully picked who we're gonna sell to. And Green Wolf was notorious for, they weren't a huge shop, but they were notorious for carrying the hottest shit, yeah, all the newest shit. Like they would, they, you know, shortly after at the same time or before Luke at Purple Elephant, like they had the shit down there. And so I hit him up. I never even fucking exchanged names. I don't think hit him up on Instagram. Hey, do you want to buy the shit? We we're supposed to meet at a high times cup. We both got busy. I left samples for him. <laughs> Brian from fucking Green Wolf. Yeah, true, yep. true OG. Yeah, true OG. I a lot of love for what Green Wolf did. And he's, I was like, it's 3,600. And he was like, God damn. He's like, we'll give it a shot. <laughs> yeah. And so he fucking that agreed. That is him too, for real. And That's I think dope. we heard yeah. the same answer for the same price. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no and Green Wolf no, fucking put us on, though. dude. Yeah, 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 he did. And they put us on. They gave us a chance and it did well. And soon as there's other people that watch their menu just like we did soon as it started getting on there fucking started getting calls from the sp the people that knew about the fucking northern cow the gelato the, and the cookies the culture, high the culture and so it was we would take calls from any or it was all instagram we would take i would fucking take a response uh or a dm from anyone like really? it didn't matter your Hell size yeah. you just had to send a picture of your fucking corporate paperwork which is a joke at that point yeah. um and fucking these people started and so we started selecting and we weren't outbound selling at all we were like we didn't care about being in a harbor side which is probably the biggest shop at the time we didn't care about being in the bigger shops we cared about being in the green wolves mm -hmm. or at the deliveries of the that had a similar type menu and metro um Blumen hit us up uh and he was getting a pound or two at a time for a while he's a young guy i didn't know how old he was at the time once again, never met any of these people. This was all Instagram, not even a phone call. This was all of our business was done on DM. All the like setting up of it, of course, coordination once it was like pickup, but all the transactions were started over Instagram. And uh, I didn't even meet Brian at fucking Green Wolf for like years. We finally met one day and we're like, brother, it's like partied all fucking night. We're NorCal, you're like, so Cal Dude, why have we not been hanging yeah. out? Thank you. It's like, didn't even know what each other looked like. That's dope. Uh, but then Metro started buying some. And he's buying one, two. And then one day he just jumped up to fucking 10 pounds. He's like, I want all the biscotti I can get. I want all. I'm like, and I fucking, I call him up. I'm like, what's going on? He's like, <laughs> the Migos, they fucking, they're, they're buying all of it. Like they can't get enough of it. No, like, no fucking shit. And this is after you know, we did the deal with Burner and Burner had talked about it and kind of shouted it out like motherfucker, this is killer. And they're, and I'm like, how much? And they're paying 4,000 a fucking pound. He's like 4,000 a pound. Fucking they buy as much as I can come. We kept trying to give them other strains. All they wanted was biscotti. They had gelato 41 <gasps> too, but preferred biscotti. Um, Fire. No gel and aid. Didn't want to fuck with it. Biscotti. Wow. Fire. And then they put it, then gelato is in like a offset, put it in the Calvin Harris song. And then biscotti was in one song. I don't biscotti remember. was in a big song. Yeah. What was Literally it? the hook of the song. What was it? What was it? I don't even remember. I'm blanking. It goes something like smoking biscotti. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, there's three guys like yeah, hyping yeah. each other up while they're rapping, but yeah, I'm blanking on what it was, but yes. And then it was like, boom, we it's went up another Scotty, Scotty, Scotty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then we stepped up another fucking level, you know, when that was happening and then their tour bus got fucking pulled over in, uh, I think South Carolina, um, one of those Southern States over there. And it's on the news. You know, the cops like to put everything on the table and fucking it's on the news. 
And then TMZ picks it up and then it's everywhere. And it was a cookies pound bag and a, and a connected pound bag and a couple cookies uh, or connected eights and shit. And then we were just like, boom, then everyone kind of knew who, who connected was even that helped blow up cookies too. So, and then they just kept rapping about it. I went and met with them in Beverly Hills once and gave them some weed and fucking, they tried offset, tried to fucking, he's like, I'm not paying for this. I'm like, <laughs> damn he's like, like, no. I thought, he's like i thought this was free i'm like they had bought all of it before i'm like i didn't come down here to give you free weed i came down here to fucking thank you yeah. for for fucking yeah. buying our shit but i'm selling this to you yeah and he's like fuck all right i'll only take one then like try to like punk me at his Man, house celebs and make are me feel fun, st- bro. Make me feel stupid and i was just like lame and they're like let's do a deal it's crazy. i'm like no. it's crazy when you get let behind Love the curtain that. No, that was the setting though for you to say that. Well, this isn't going to work then because yep, fucking <laughs> no way. We could have done this way cooler. And- you know what's crazy? I, I I booked them for a concert in July uh-huh. of 2021. They canceled. Live Nation picked up some dates. Live Nation canceled on them, and we're still waiting to settle that. We they they <laughs> kept check. our deposit money, everything. Really? Crazy man, big yeah. check, crazy. And the show was for like kids too, so it's just really? like. Bad business. So you spotted yeah. it though right away, and you got yeah. you know you got the hint. And he started doing stuff like that. He wasn't like paying Metro for. He would get weed on the franchise. It's like what the fuck. Um, so we didn't do anything with them, Damn. and that kind of soured my fucking. That soured because we had been talking to them a little bit. And we we're gonna do something with them, and that totally soured me on on doing anything with any kind of celebrity. And then Metro is like, hey, um, Travis Scott wants to fucking wants to talk to you he loves your weed and and to be honest i didn't i knew who he was but i didn't realize how big he was and and i was burnt out on the situation i was like nah not even having a conversation i'm cool so i'm guessing you had a couple other celebrity things too where you were just like it all just doesn't make sense yeah we had met with yeah. them and it, you could just tell it's like you're not this isn't going to be authentic you're not super like the ironically the migos is the one that if they would have been workable that had been the one that could have worked the best because they still fucking put our fucking shit in their songs still and it cohesively just totally makes sense and they fucking yeah, yeah. smoke it all the time like exactly. it's real some of the other people that we had talked to one of them didn't even fucking smoke weed one of them had never even heard of our strains it was just like they heard we grew the best weed so we should do a deal with them it was like no fucking way if it's not authentic people won't fucking they'll feel it that it's not authentic and fucking weed customers you can call them you can stereotype them a bunch of different ways about a bunch of different things but they don't like the bullshit they don't fucking buy the fucking it's like skateboarding they'll file they'll follow some hype for a little bit but the high if the hype doesn't lead up live up to itself they'll fucking jump off of it it needs to be a hundred percent authentic even if it's you holding the l yeah hold the l for sure Be authentic about it yeah sometimes we all take l's yep here it is yeah that i mean wow so like four then four months four or five months go by and he hits mo hits me back up um but but props to fucking metro bloomin like metro bloomin played a huge role Mo played a huge role. I give that dude. I didn't even realize that he was fucking 23 at this time. Like he was dealing with all the different celebs, but I want to give a shout out to Mo. Uh, I got a lot of respect for him. He's done a lot for, for connected. A lot of people don't know that. And uh, I need you never fucking ask for anything. We're, we're fucking anytime I can. I'm trying to plug him with this or that. Like he's gonna, we're gonna get him something, do something with him someday. But uh, I really fucking appreciate it. And and that guy's done a ton for us. He's a good dude. Shout um, out, Mo. Yeah. Big shout out, Metro Blooming, man. For yeah. real. I need you to plug me with the the delivery. Uh, yeah. Hook up with that. No problem. And we always got that. Yeah. We smoke it. Yeah. yeah we smoke it. We want to get more on the couch. Those are all the the original bangers. Those are like, to me, that lineup is like Coca Cola, Mountain Dew, like, like that's it's it's the staples of like weed. Yeah, like you can keep drinking it, you can keep smoking it. You know, it's the same thing. You know what I mean? Where it's like it doesn't get old. You know, yeah, what I people mean? just timeless. want the tried and true. It's like it's just it just the, works. The original, you know. Yeah, it's, you can know you can timeless. count on it. It's like the same. So. So Travis hits him mm-hmm. up again, like four or five months later. And I'm like, fine, I'll go meet with him. And I like mentioned it to someone there. Like, Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. Like Travis Scott's not the Migos. Like you need to go fucking meet with this guy. And so I went and met with him. He was super cool. We met in his studio. And is this before the McDonald's collab or before? Yes, it is yes. before. Okay. It's before. 
I think at that time he had only done one Nike shoe, maybe two. So it was before a lot of of his big, before the Fortnite thing. You hadn't seen the potential yet. No, no. All I really knew, I knew some of his music, but all I really knew is that he was fucking Kylie Jenner's baby daddy. Exactly. And and that's a big deal. So yeah. you know uh, that can push <laughs> that gave that can push some product if that was used, wielded properly. <laughs> um, so people are like, you got to meet. Went to studio, brought a bunch of different phenos, um, some different stuff, and he was like, "No, I just want the biscotti." I'm like, "Well, that doesn't really make sense." To I was like, "We got some crosses with biscotti, so why don't I bring you those?" I thought you maybe were the more I had heard you were more OG type, but. Uh, no, he, he wanted something biscotti. So we went back to the stable and we had recently done some pheno hunts and cooked him up something that he selected. But unfortunately the, the lawyers, once the, these deals go to the lawyers, especially his lawyers, fucking, we negotiated the contract for like a year and a half. It just went on forever. And it wasn't a huge sum of money because he was blowing up during this time and the most he could have made was smaller than it it was it was like about what he'd get paid for a couple of nights you know concert so but he really wanted to do it it was more about passion it wasn't about money to him but the rest of his team wasn't motivated because they're not it was such a small deal compared to what and they you know typically management gets paid on a percentage yep. i'm speculating that that's what was no, going but it on. makes sense but his team was not into it they yeah. told him that they they told us multiple times that they told him to stop wasting his time and don't do it they were fucking super hard to deal with but he wanted it but they were only thinking about the money factor. They weren't thinking that. And now he's going to be culturally relevant to the whole week community. Not that he isn't for music, but right. in a different way. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, I got to assume that that's the reason that they, just, yeah, they said, actually, they're like, this deal is nothing. This is one concert, two concerts for us. Wow. This is fucking not a priority, but it so it just went on forever because it clearly wasn't a priority. By the time we had signed the deal, he had, uh, he had had the McDonald's deal, the Fortnite deal, the PlayStation, multiple shoes. And so he had really blown up and he just didn't have a whole lot of time for, for the promotion of this brand. And right when he, he found some time and he was starting to ramp up the cactus farm. Instagram was starting to get some stuff. They had done some of their own uh, photography for it. Then fucking Astro World happened and it was just starting to catch some steam. It was just starting to do good. I mean, that's a classic example of it's not authentic because he hadn't promoted it yet. And it said can buy connected on the back. It was one of our best genetics. It, we fucking grew it and it fucking was barely selling. Cause people don't fucking they're wow. like, is Travis Scott's brand? He's not fucking <clears throat> really getting behind it. What's going on here? It's not authentic. We don't fucking give a fuck. He's not smoking it in every video and talking about it. Yeah, it's, doing, not, it's not yeah, real. It, it pop wasn't ups with connected yeah. at shops. And yeah. Yeah, 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 it wasn't doing good. And right when he started to promote it a little bit, started Astro World, literally three accounts called and said, we want to return what we have. And Ooh. everyone else was like, we're not buying anymore. We're just going to wait and see. And some shops made us discount. They just wanted to blow it out. It stopped selling at some places. Arizona kept selling great, strangely enough. But <laughs> California uh, did not like that shit. And uh, so we had to put production on halt. It's a super bummer because I've followed it closely. Like, it's really unfortunate what happened. But it definitely wasn't his fault. And the the few interactions I've had with the guy, he would have been fucking, had he known that he's so about his fans, had he known that his fans were getting, you yeah, know, he it was like a serious, of course, people are passing out at every concert, you know, it's you crazy. Be a true dick, which most people are not to just let someone die. Yeah, no, that's dude, a rare person no to be way. like, yeah, yeah, fuck you. And so he's being fucking railroaded on that. Yeah. It's a bummer. And. I talked to him the other day and he's like, come on, let's like, just give it another chance. And so we're talking about it. We want, we, I want to see it successful. If he really got behind it, the fucking thing would go crazy. What, what, what did he say about really getting behind it? He said, he's like, I'll put, I'm going to put my own money into it. I'm going to fucking, uh, we're going to film a commercial. Like you're going to see, like we're, we got the focus now. And I he smokes you. weed. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So he he can, he's going to be smoking it. He's going to authentically, you know, represent. 
Yeah. He, did, did a, yeah. I he wonder, smokes. He smokes. He smokes backwoods. He smokes fucking. He smokes a lot of fucking weed. <laughs> I wonder how many how many brands and deals he got dropped from. So he claimed. So the the cacti deal fell apart, but I think sales were suffering. Before. I think that was just a product thing, right? Yeah, like, that wasn't good. It, but people gave that bad reviews. Yeah, it sounds like um, no one else has dropped him. Um, Dior yeah. still. Dior postponed the collection. Uh, <gasps> Nike postponed the launch of the shoes, but he said everyone's riding with him. So yeah, I, he's just like when the truth comes out and everyone realizes I had nothing to fuck. You know, I, I yeah, literally did not know. Cool. I couldn't see. You know, all things, everything's gonna pan out. What do you think? Re- repositioning and going back into it. Are, are you gonna still try to push forward and get something out there? Look, to be quite honest, like. To like, is it the best thing for connected? Like, it's it's like it's been a really tough relationship. We spent a lot of time and energy. On the same hand, what I hate seeing is people get kicked when they're down Mm -hmm. and fucking kicked when it's unfair. (sighs) And look, he was on another level, but he's on the top of the world. And imagine what that felt like to like be at the top of the world. Some really unfortunate shit happens. You're taking all the all the heat for um, unfairly. And literally no one's fucking picking up the phone anymore. All your contacts are like, they're not dropping you, but they're putting everything on hold. They're all the contracts. And so the guy called, had, if he didn't call up and be mm-hmm. like, Hey, like, give me a second chance. He was super humble and super respectful. And he's like, give me a second chance. And in, in like a man to man type of way, not to a Travis Scott, to a fucking Caleb counts type. Not, he was just like straight up. And it's really hard for me to fucking, yeah. not respect that and and want to see him succeed and want to see him get through this so i do so we're working on how we can make it work i think awesome. we're, i think we're going to try to give it another shot and you guys i mean you put in the due diligence with what strain and how it's grown so we know it's going to be fire yeah that's not that's it's not so even good. the case so yeah. you know what i'm saying like so it's that's that's the great part yeah. it's fire yeah so if he gets behind it and if that's if I, it's it's authentic i know it's going to be successful so he said he is. I'll take him at his word, and hopefully we can make this shit pop off. Well, we'll look forward to you in the music video. <laughs> yeah, straight up. We need to see you in the big Rari, man. Pulling Counts up. times Pull Travis. Up big man. Bring both of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> for real, for real. Bro, yeah. what do you it's like? It's lit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you like to do in your free time when it's not cannabis? Because I'm sure that consumes most yeah, of your what, day and most of your time. of Mr. Counts like? Um. So I, kids. I like to, yeah, I got a couple of kids. I got a couple of boys. I love Costa Rica is like my second home. So I spend a lot of time there. I built a house there a few years ago. Um, what part of Costa Rica? Uh, it's called Playa Hermosa. It's in um, Punta Arenas. It's just, there's three Playa Hermosas in Costa Rica. So it's on the Pacific side, just south of Jaco. Um and during the pandemic, I actually took my kids. My ex-wife went down there. We lived down there for five months. I put my kids in school. It was a fucking epic experience. Um, and I met my current girlfriend uh, down there. Um, she moved here with her with her daughter, and so spent a lot of time with them. They neither one of them spoke any English when I met them, and she learned super quick. And their daughter's learning. Got her daughter in school here, and. So I spent that's it's it's family life, dude. It's uh that's another reason for for just kind of chill, you know, you just get older. It's like I don't need the fucking I don't need any extra drama. I don't need the fame <laughs> for sure. But the part of the reason I'm doing this now is because I think it's just at the end of the end of the day, I think the consumer wants to know. They want to know who's behind their brands. Uh-huh. Um, they want transparency and they deserve to hear the whole story and and uh and we've never really been like accessible, right? And we've never really been willing to give up the answers. And You're definitely a hard one to get to. Yeah. Oh we yeah. Through multiple emails. Yeah. I hope you guys know this. Yeah. Yeah. This is why you this haven't guy, seen him man, on other the platforms. Infamous. This is the dude you wish you knew back in the Five Two Fifteen. <laughs> the plug. Yeah. So uh, I love to cook, um, but yeah, just family. I love to work out. I love to super into fucking uh, infrared sauna, ice bath combos. Um, listen to joe rogan all the time love fucking all the shit he's talking about and you do any hunting or archery or uh, no shooting, i don't like that. um i've only been hunting a couple of times i'm not into i i 
a bunch of my friends are. So I eat like a hunter, which is <laughs> what I care about. They're into fishing and hunting. My freezers are stocked with elk, water, buffalo, fucking uh, ahi, mahi, mahi. Fucking, yeah. I got venison. I got all kinds of shit. So I eat like a hunter. When you're smoking, what do you, what's your go-to smoke? Dude, I'm on the hitchhiker right now. Um, that's one of our, our, our latest strain drops. It's different. It's super gassy. Um, it's, I'm just so on it. I, I was really uh, involved in the, uh, in the marketing and the design of the label of it. It's just like, it's old school fucking late eighties, like horror movie hitchhiker. That guy's in the fucking, you keep seeing him at the same gas station and the same thing. He's just going to fuck you up. <laughs> <That's-> <laughs> Don't, and give, that's, don't give him a ride. Dude, don't, don't, don't fuck him. bro. Watch your back. Look at you these do. too. Like these vape men, these are sick. I've been oh, hitting wow. this for like the last half an hour now. Is this what had you choking on? Oh man, this, this I keep I'm huffing down. it. I had yeah, this guy, I kept laughing. Oh. This guy can't let off it, man. Yeah, man, these are fire, bro. These are our live dope. resin pens. It's proprietary hardware. We got the temperature dialed in. Like those are strain specific, those are our genetics. Uh, each brand drops three uh, new colorways every uh, every quarter. So wow. it's been a huge hit. We were there wasn't really a live resin disposable on the market. Wow. Fields had one, but they didn't have super big production. Mm-hmm. I think it was a point three. It was good, but we were really the first ones to do it in volume um, for the disposables. And now we launched a, a 510 one gram live resin and we've got a cured resin. Um, because you know, we're a flower indoor flower company first and foremost, but we're going to look to continue to build our product category. Um, but it has to be representative of what we do. It has to basically whatever cannabinoids are in it have to have been derived from our breeding program Mm -hmm. or our stable, um, whether it's going to be edibles or infused pre-rolls, it's all going to be strain specific sourced from us. Um, so yeah, we're looking right now in, in Arizona, all we are is is indoor flower, but hopefully we'll be able to launch those pens um, soon enough. Absolutely. It's been a great product category. Like, you know, I wasn't a distillate guy. I didn't even out of convenience. I just didn't mm-hmm. really enjoy it. But, no. but traveling as much as I do, these have been killer and the c- different colorways. People just fucking. Yeah. They is. love these don't, they yeah, these don't hit like these aren't just dist- like, I mean, these taste like taking yeah. a dab. Yeah. It's different. Any last shout outs, last words, words to the young, young hustlers. Mm-hmm. Cause last that- shout out, shout out to my team, man. Um, I wouldn't be here uh, if it wasn't for the people, the people that connected, the people that were there before it was connected, the people that have uh, rode through the hardest fucking, some of the hardest times I've ever experienced. Um, so it's really shout out to the people because if you don't appreciate and recognize the the people holding you up and surrounding you, then you're missing it. And uh, so big shout out to them. I really appreciate it. Um, and the little, the, the fucking young entrepreneurs take risks, take risks. Do not be afraid of failure and uh, own your reputation. Fucking. That's all you got. Yeah. So, Straight up. I think that's the, hey, that's man. the best I got. You already know it's episode 37 season season three finale caleb counts founder of connected here you have his first smoke of the day we're out thank you guys appreciate it thanks for having me thank you homie for real man this was for the the culture right here that's it peace yo what's up first smoke family just want to take a few seconds to shout out some special partners of the show Make sure you guys go check out Grow Generation, the largest hydroponic retailer in the nation, over 60 retail stores, growgeneration.com. They also carry some awesome products there. Blackleaf, tell them a little bit about our next sponsor, Power SI. This is what I use in my garden. This is what the best growers in the country are using. This is what the best growers in the world are using. For more information on our partners, Click in the description below. We're going to include all the links, all the information, everything you guys need to know to get down with any of these companies. Shout out to Grow Generation, Power SI. We appreciate you guys. First Smoke Family forever. Hey, what up? It's Blackleaf. I'm here to talk about one of the sponsors for First Smoke of the Day podcast, AthenaProducts.com, Athena Nutrients. If you want to see some of the premier growers in the country who rock Athena products, check out Athena.ag on Instagram. 
and you can see everybody who rocks with Athena. First Smoke of the Day podcast, Athena Plant Nutrients. Yo, Jungle Boys have been playing with fire since 2006. Pioneer cultivators based out of Los Angeles. You can find their product at TLC Collective in LA. For more info, go to jungleboys.com and follow at Jungle Boys on all platforms. Welcome to the jungle. What up, First Smoke of the Day fam? It's Blackleaf here to talk about one of our sponsors for First Smoke of the Day podcast, and that's NeptuneSeedBank.com. They got one of the most wider range of seeds on the internet, everything from boutique craft farmers all the way to the big breeders we've all heard about. If you want to see Blackleaf seeds and some of the other best seeds on the internet, check out NeptuneSeedBank.com. 